Okay. Quiet, everyone. It is now 7 p.m. and I am reconvening to open session and calling to order the regular Board of Education meeting for Indian Prairie District 204 on Monday, October 18th, 2021. Jeannie, will you please call the roll? Mr. Rising. Here. Ms. Deming. Ms. Grover. Present. Ms. Donahue. Here. Ms. Jane. Here. Ms. Fosdick. Here. Mr. Krubis. Here. We have a quorum. Ms. Jane, will you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Pledge of Allegiance. Our next board meeting will be held on Monday, November 1st. And now we have some board salutes. Um, Ms. Fosdick. Indian Prairie School District 204 among top districts in Illinois and the US. Indian Prairie School District 204 is among the top school districts in Illinois and the US in Niche's 2022 list of best school districts. Indian Prairie ranked number 11 out of 411 districts in the state and 56 in the country with an overall grade of A minus. Sorry, A plus. <laughs> There's a dash. <laughs> a plus. Springbrook Elementary School ranked number one for best public elementary school in Illinois, also earning an overall grade of A plus. Niche evaluated more than 11 thousand districts on factors such as scores on SAT, ACT, and statewide tests, graduation rates, college readiness, and teacher quality. Congratulations to Springbrook Elementary and District 204. Mr. Rising. The board salutes Wabanzi Valley Senior Jay Schnab Rajish, who was elected president of Illinois DECA Jay Schnav is the first Wabonzi Valley student elected to an officer position at the state level in the past 20 years. DECA prepares emerging leaders and entrepreneurs in marketing, finance, hospitality, and management in high schools and colleges around the globe. Congratulations to Jay Schnav on this great accomplishment. Mr. Krubis. Matea Valley teacher, receives Teacher of the Year Award. The board salutes Matea Valley High School teacher Meredith Jordan, who was named the 2021 High School Physical Education Teacher of the Year in the Northeastern District of Illinois by the Illinois Association of Health, Physical, Education, Recreation, and Dance. These awards are given in the recognition of outstanding instructional, instructional performance for elementary, middle, and secondary school physical education, as well as in adapted dance, health, and adventure education. Award recipients have shown their ability to motivate today's youth to participate in a lifetime of physical activity. Meredith will celebrate at an awards banquet in December. Congratulations, Meredith. Ms. Jane. The board salutes Prairie Children Preschool for once again achieving the Gold Circle of Quality designation by Excel Ray Illinois for 2021. This is the highest rating that can be that can be received and indicates a high quality learning and development program at Prairie Children Preschool. The Gold Circle of Quality recognizes programs which have demonstrated demonstrated a commitment to providing quality early childhood education to children in their district. Congratulations to Principal Sally Osborne and her staff on this stellar achievement. Next, we have our student representative report by Nathia Mahapudi from Wabanzi Valley High School. Welcome. Thank you. Um, good evening. My name is Nithya Mulhudi, and I am a senior at Wabonzi Valley High School this year. It is an honor to be able to be representing Dubvi this school year, as well as speaking before you all today. 
Wabonzi Valley would like to thank Superintendent Dr. Talley, the Board of Education, and everyone involved in providing guidance this past and present year during trying times. We are thankful for your leadership and vision in making our community a better place for all students and faculty members. At WVHS, we are very thankful to be able to have everyone back in the building, as we are on stepping stones to getting back to normal as soon as possible. Although students and faculty are back in the building, the requirements of wearing face coverings inside is still mandatory for everyone. We kick-started the year with our annual fall food truck rally, where we, ha where we had fall sports scrimmages, senior class t-shirt sales, warrior warehouse, food trucks of course, and so much school spirit. We wouldn't want it to have started the year off in any other way. The week of October 4th to 10th was homecoming week. Wabonzi Valley students and staff participated in Spirit Week with Green and Gold Day, Tie-Dye Tuesday, Class Color for Powder Puff, Jersey and Sports Day, and Pink Out for Breast Cancer Awareness. We were excited to see all the energy, creativity, and time put in by everyone to make our homecoming week the best possible. Our theme this year for homecoming was Under the City Lights, and we held true to that by lighting Wabonzi up. We had so many students in attendance with a huge stage, biodegradable confetti canyons, and so much fun. Thank you to everyone who participated, as well as student council advisors, board, and members for putting everything together. Thank you to our administration for all the guidance and support as well. On September 27th, Wabonzi Valley hosted its annual Dancing with the Warriors competition. The Wabonzi Valley seniors, also known as the 2022 crew, took home the title in an intense competition featuring all grade levels and every single warrior. The 2022 crew took home first place and also ended up being voted as the most entertaining group. As a reward, they were able to perform at the homecoming pep assembly and they were absolutely phenomenal. Our clubs and activities are up and running with a total of 63 clubs setting route and getting students engaged. On October 5th, Wabonzi Valley DECA had their fall leadership conference. DECA is an IHSA competitive business club where members choose a certain event, become proficient, and compete first at sectionals, then state, and then internationals. At this year's fall leadership conference, two WV DECA members ran for state officer positions. We are very proud to announce that Jason Rajesh, our VP of Finance and Fundraising, is now also Illinois DECA state president. Congratulations, Jay. We are so proud of you. Wabonzi Valley Key Club, our largest club at Wabonzi, has started again. This year, we have 353 members, which is the highest we have ever had. Key Club aims to provide community service and have members give back to the community. There were numerous community service opportunities offered this year and are still continuing to happen, as well as collaborations with other high schools for events. Last year, WB Key Club created their core curriculum tutoring program to help elementary and middle school students with high school tutors. We collaborated with White Eagle and Owen Elementary Schools, as well as the John C. Dunham STEM Partnership School. We are aiming to restart this program again in late November. This past weekend, Dub V. Munn had their annual Model UN Conference at Wabonzi Valley High School. Model United Nations is a club that incorporates international diplomacy at the high school level, as students, also known as delegates, participate in a variety of current world, world, current world issues and historical ones. Numerous schools attended the conference, which was also extremely special as it was the 25th anniversary of the start of Model UN at Wabonzi. Thank you to the MON advisors, board members, and volunteers that helped make the conference successful. Dub V's boys golf are conference champions this year. We have seen the amount of immense hard work and dedication they have put into this sport, which we have no doubt has helped them get to where they are today. Salil Kunduja qualified for the state competition of boys golf and competed with over 100 of the best players around the state at the den at Fox Creek lo located in Bloomington Normal. He was able to finish 12th overall at the 3A state tournament. Once again, congratulations. Wabonzi Valley is so proud of you. This past weekend, Wabonzi Valley's boys cross country team became conference champions. Led by Angel Solis and Ethan Marshall, they defended their home course all the three miles along with the support of Andres Perez, Jacob Tucker, and Chris Misardino. This is Wabonzi Valley's first boys cross country conference champions championship since their absolutely phenomenal run at their Upstate 8 performance in 2004. They have worked so hard to get to this moment and we can't wait to continue to support them on their regional journey this week. To sum up, the Wabonzi Warriors have had many events that have happened since the school year started. We are excited to continue to be able to participate in as many more as we can and are excited for the future and what it will bring. This is all for Wabonzi Valley School Board report for the date of October 18, 2021. 
I'm Nithya Malapudi. It was a pleasure speaking before you all tonight. I hope everything else goes smoothly. And as always, go Warriors. Thank you. Thank you. All right, our next agenda, agenda item is a very special honor that we have to honor our National Merit Scholarship semifinalists. So we're going to ask you to come up to the front when your name is called to receive your award. And we ask you to stay up front with your classmates so we can get a picture. So congratulations to all of you. Valley. If you'll stand up, please. Who has I have Matthias. She's inherited. So do uh, I just call Mateus? the names? You'll come forward, Stacy. Yeah, I'm going to say it again. I reached out. Yeah. Okay. Ian Alta, Ala, Ian Alta Cruz. Congratulations. Congratulations. Ria Anandpara. Karthik Raj Arukonda, Daniel Drayton, Abhav Garde, Devij Garg, Sean Hickey, Uma Ayer. Shivam Kuk, Hari Charan Masunuri, Sama Nayakanti, Saiwan Ru, Aman Shah. Anitej Siluveru, Mohit Singh, Sanjana Sivakumar, Shravni Suram, Nikhil Venkat. Lauren Bernheim. Congratulations to all of you in Go Go Mustangs. They ready? And hello, so sweet. Sanjar Arib. 
Sanjar Arib, no. Baavi Barnwall, Niharika Roshan Thalapudi, Kunal Daftari, Ashaka Dayal. Amanda Eldridge, Sanjay Ganesh, Sean Galimas, Catherine Graw, David P. Kelly Hong, mm -hmm. Umulya Zhanglagada, Anshu Kumar, Tiffany Black, Theodore Lin, Rohan Mendez, Sophie Meng, yeah. <laughs> Ivan Parakal, Onya Puluru. Varan Ramsubu, Ishan Ramesh, James Rosenberger, Arnav Chandelier, Maggie Shi. Prina Sharaf, Anish Singh, Aditya Ter, Anaga Tewari, and Vidaya. Venkat Asha Lam. <laughs> Congratulations, Wildcats. For Wabanzi Valley, we have Divya Chari, Congratulations. 
Joshua Chi, Sophia Kroll, Ayush Desai, Brian Gong, Molly Grumman, David Ho, In June, Michael Liu, Mm -hmm. Like Michael's look. <laughs> Very nice. Dishita Mansukani. Sabrina May. Arush Mishra. And Soham Shah. All right, such a special occasion tonight. It was great to have a big audience for that, so thank you. <laughs> so it's now time for public comment, which I know many of you are here for. <laughs> um, 60 minutes is allowed for public comment, and each person is limited to three minutes. When addressing the board, we ask that you respect the confidentiality and safety of our students and school board, school district personnel. We also ask that those addressing the board be cognizant that this is an open meeting and is available to all age groups, and as such, ask that you consider who the audience members are this evening and keep your comments age appropriate. Public comment represents the voice and opinion of the speaker. There will be no feedback from the board members during the meeting, but follow-up may be provided by an administrator as appropriate. I also want to say we had uh, 26 people sign up um, and if you calculate 20 uh, 20 speakers times three minutes that's six 60 minutes so we would like to try and get everyone in so if you can shorten your time that would be greatly appreciated because we'd love to hear from everyone otherwise we will have to cut off at 60 minutes and also speakers will will be shut off at three minutes so you will be asked to sit down so. With that, I'm going to announce the speaker and then I'll say what the next, who the next speaker is so that they can be ready to get up. Okay. So the first speaker is Serena Lee and she will be followed by Cheryl Borendale. Borendale. Good evening and thank you for your time. My name is Serena Lee and I'm the proud parent of a third grader at Clow Elementary School. I'm here along with many members of the Clow and surrounding communities who are all wearing green to show their support for Clow. We know that your work is very difficult and we appreciate your time and consideration. We know that you have the best interests of our children at heart. That is why the Clow community is here tonight. Any boundary committee concept that calls for the closure of CLOW is not in the best interests of our children or the district. The closure of CLOW is wrong for four reasons. First, CLOW is not under-enrolled or underutilized. Our general education capacity is over 70%, which is the median level for elementary school capacity levels in the district. In addition, CLOW space is 100% utilized for elementary school programming, as CLOW hosts an additional 24 students from other schools as part of its special education programs, which increases CLOW's capacity to above 
Second, the closure of cloud does not solve any of the overcrowding issues in the north and has no impact on the feeders being proposed in the various concepts. In other words, the broken feeders and boundary issues can be addressed without closing cloud. They are completely unrelated. Third, the closure of cloud will result in a host of new problems for the district, including creating new overcrowded schools in the south and transportation issues. Concept one would send 250 students to Springbrook Elementary. That puts Springbrook to over 90% capacity overnight, making it one of the most crowded schools in the district. If the, number, if the district's numbers are off at all, Springbrook could be pushing 100% in a few years. This is a concern because the current data being considered to determine capacity does not adequately account for the influx of new families who have moved into our neighborhoods, me being one of them. In the Cloud District alone, 170 homes have sold in the last two years. In a few years' time, the district could be faced with reopening Clow as an elementary school or engaging in another boundary redrawing process, both of which will be expensive and time-consuming for the district. Furthermore, any shift of Clow students will change Clow from essentially a 100% walking school to a 100% busing school, requiring buses for over 350 students, which would add to the district's expenses. Fourth, and most troubling, is the closure of Clow violates the boundary committee criteria and contradicts the district's campaign on mental health last year. Closing any school in this climate will irreparably harm children at a time when they are just trying to get back to normal. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the next speaker is Cheryl Barrowdale, followed by Steve Edwards. And if um, we're applauding, it's going to take up our time. So. I'm the mother of two children at Bilta Elementary, which is proposed to be closed under Concept 2, and I want to agree with a lot of the sentiments of Serena Lee, which is that we think that this is the wrong time to be closing schools in 204, and that that is detrimental to all of our students' mental health and their educational health. John Hattie, the renowned educational researcher, has calculated the effect of closing schools and moving students from school to school, and the effect is negative 0.34. Corporal punishment in schools is 0.33. A student being diagnosed with a severe case of depression is 0.35. If you want to see how serious of an issue this is for our students, right, this is a serious mental health issue, a serious educational issue that could affect them. And so we oppose closing our schools on the south side. Uh, of the three schools under, under consideration on the south side, Built Elementary is the only one whose school population is currently growing. Pulte Homes has broken ground already on a new subdivision within our boundary that is likely to attract many young families, as all new schools, all new housing does. Uh, and we also have the largest and the newest facility. The redistricting committee has claimed that it wants to keep defined neighborhoods together, that that is one of their stated goals. Bilta is, by definition, a defined community. We are the o not only the only Bolingbroke school, but we are physically separated from every other neighborhood in 204 by a quarry, by a golf course, by a river, by a water district plant. Uh, and there are no way for any of our students to walk, for any of our students to be connected to any of those other neighborhoods. That we are, and all of our students would then have to be bused, again, adding to that sense of isolation for our students, adding to the expense for the district and moving our students out of that area. Uh, Bilta is also more than 50% South Asian students, and we have done a, f a wonderful job. I think our school, our school has done a wonderful job of hiring uh, teachers and staff members to work with that community. We have a very defined and different community in our, in our school that we would like to keep together. Uh, we also feel that as the only Bolingbroke school, a lot of times people sort of, get, we get lost in the shuffle, right? We don't want to be devalued as a, a less important part of this community. And so we're gonna urge the district to keep built to open, to not close any of the schools on the south side, and to support concept three. Repurposing Indian Plains as part of concept three 
not only really alleviates the north side overcrowding, but it does what should have been done a long time ago. It brings our special education students back into their communities, into their least restrictive environments where they should be rather than isolating them. And so built to families are saying no to concept two, and we support concept three. Thank you. Next speaker is Steve Edwards, followed by Dr. George Miller. Members of the board, this evening I stand with my peers in opposition to concept one and the closing and repurposing of Graham Elementary. Currently, my daughter attends first grade at Graham and my son will be attending kindergarten at Graham next fall. We moved to High Meadow last August as an investment in our children's education. When we chose High Meadow, one of the main factors was Graham Elementary, the heart of the neighborhood. Its reputation for excellence, small class sizes, and proximity to our home were all major draws. Proximity was especially important because it offers the following benefits. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Benefit one, Thanks. walkability. Studies have shown that children who walk to school have been found to have higher academic performance in terms of attention and alertness, showing stronger verbal, numeric, and reasoning skills. They also experience higher levels of happiness and lower levels of stress. Walking to school is also an excellent source of physical activity, and walking to school with friends and neighbors helps to foster a strong sense of community and belonging. Many of Graham's students either walk or ride bikes to school. Benefit two, safety. Apart from students having to cross dangerous busy streets, the proposed relocation schools are further away in terms of walkability and driving, especially with Bilta. For River Run students, Bilta is over two miles away, and for High Meadow students, Bilta is roughly three miles away. There is no safe way for students from either neighborhood to walk there. With multiple traffic lights and new housing development in Sawgrass, this is sure to cause even more congestion. When considering proximity, Kendall and Patterson are much closer. High Meadow is less than a mile from Kendall, and River Run is less than half a mile from both Kendall and Patterson. Though Concept 1 continues to evolve, it potentially puts our students further away from their home neighborhood and school. Being close to school is especially important with our family, as both our children have severe food allergies. While we absolutely trust nurses and staff, it is important for us to be nearby in the event of an emergency, as I'm sure it is for all families. Benefit three, less congestion. An added benefit that Graham provides for the surrounding neighborhoods is that there is less congestion. If children from Graham are bused to Kendall and Bilta, the added car and bus traffic would cause greater congestion in those neighborhoods. In addition to congestion, the district would have increased reliability on buses during a bus driver shortage. So what's the takeaway? By closing schools, you would be hurting two thriving student communities to inconvenience multiple others, and inconvenience multiple others. Therefore, we are requesting that school closings be removed from consideration in favor of a more equitable concept that combines the best parts of concept one and three while keeping all 204 schools open. Thank you for your time and consideration, and sorry about the mask. <laughs> sorry about right. that. And the next speaker is Dr. George Miller, and he will be followed by Matthew Schreiner. My backyard backs into Bilta. Um, my daughter was in the first class at Bilton in 1999. I had a nephew who spent three months at Bilton before he died in a distracted driving accident. So I'm certainly attached to Bilton. Um, but I'm not here for those reasons. I'm here as an educator. I've been an educator for, I was an educator for 37 years. And I think we have a chance for a teachable moment here in this community. And it's great to be enthusiastic and want our side to win. But I think in this world, I think all of us have to understand, I think, three things. Justice, the common good, and that money isn't the bottom line. And if we start closing these schools, one of these schools, what we're teaching this, the people here is that one group of students is better than another. One community is better than another. We're saying whoever screams the loudest gets the most. And we're saying that the bottom line is money, is efficiency and not children. Because anybody who's a teacher, a real teacher, is interested in the souls of the students. And I'm hoping that the school board and everybody else matters, whether you're on this side or that, but it's the souls of everybody that matters. And we have to keep that in mind as we do this. And that's why I advocate for the for the, for the common good and for justice and to say that money and efficiency is not the bottom line, I advocate for number three. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Matthews. Next speaker is Matthew Schreiner, followed by Chris Bond. Good evening, members of the Board of Education, Dr. Talley, and the wonderful community of Indian Prairie School District. My agenda here tonight as a parent and resident is to question the meaning of the phrases repurposed and offline, which have been used in the boundary review process. Being direct here, how is it that RSP, by the direction of the school board and administration, can present to the boundary committee buildings, buildings to be repurposed without presenting the plan on how the buildings will be repurposed? When I reached out to this board, asking if a plan for a repurposed building would be detailed prior to the school board's vote to actually repurpose it, I was informed by Mrs. Donahue that plans for, and I quote, plans for potentially repurposed schools will not be defined prior to boundary decisions. This seems ill responsible to the taxpayers and students of this community. So I guess the school board administration and RSP is leaving the boundary committee and this community to just speculate what we are doing with highly ranked and highly performing buildings when we ask students to vacate. Enter in the front yard, student pickup and playground conversations of this community. Will the buildings and land simply be sold off? I would assume RSP has calculated this for us for this to support their presentation of concept one budgeting. If sold, would the land be redeveloped for houses, condos, and or apartments? I will have to assume RSP has calculated this into the projected enrollments for nearby schools. Again, concept one. Will IPSD sit on the buildings until they are brought back online? I assume that the business office has explored how long we could support the cost of empty buildings. Someone here mentioned that they have seen boards in this situation turn buildings into professional development development centers and to use partner uh, and to use to partner with community organizations. That could be interesting. Business office, what are the numbers on this type of utilization compared to continuing to teach our students currently in them? Also heard that there might be high school special education and transition programs looking for a new home. Again, the word on the street. RSP business office, we assume you have the numbers for the cost to renovate an elementary building to support student, high school students and adult programs. Let's not take closing schools lightly, especially highly ranked neighborhood intact schools. I believe this community deserves to be presented with all the facts. Yes, I have a bit of a, a hidden agenda. I was kind enough to wear it on my shirt. Members of the school board, when closing and repurposing buildings, without your comment, the community is left wondering if you have one. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next speaker is Chris Vaughn, and he will be followed by Lynn Hanley. Good evening, and thank you for your time. My name is Christopher Bond, and I am the proud parent of a second grade daughter at Clow Elementary and a sixth grade son at Gregory Middle School. The Clow community is greatly concerned about the building utilization metric being used to determine which schools to repurpose in concept one, and how legally required programming will be impacted. Clow, as previously mentioned, has a functional capacity of 70%, higher than seven district elementary schools, five of which are located in the Southside region. However, when one includes special education, self-contained programming, 100% of the building resources are currently utilized for district purposes. We'd like to know why the Boundary Committee has not been allowed to consider the totality of what each building in our district is used for, versus simply looking at the number of students attending each school. If no consideration is given to legally required programs, whose regulations require lower classroom density and lower staff to student ratio levels, Schools housing such programs are at a disadvantage when looking at enrollment and per pupil finances. Clow Elementary is not an underutilized drain on district resources. There are no empty cavernous wings and mothball classrooms. It is a vibrant and inclusive community housing both general education students and valued and welcome special education students from throughout the district. This is also a population for whom the stability and consistency of their relationships with their educators and peers is key to their success. If these relationships are severed via repurposing, the effects on these students will be devastating. For these reasons, the Clow community fully supports the idea of innovation spaces from Concept 3. In Concept 1, we are reducing district capacity by two entire schools with zero mention of where impacted programming would be housed. With the demand for early childhood and special education programming increasing nationwide, wouldn't it be prudent for us to maintain the ability to adapt to changing conditions rather than closing a school already 100% utilized? Remember, these programs are federally and state mandated. The, the space to house them must be found, space that does not exist in our north side schools. So why reduce district capacity when so many aspects of our nation, region, and community are in flux? 
We do not believe you should, and therefore we support any concept that does not reduce district capacity via repurposing, fulfills the board requirement of drawing boundaries that will remain stable over time, and ensures that district flexibility continues to exist during these uncertain times. Thank you very much. Thank you. Lynn. Next speaker is Lynn Hanley, followed by Jose Leon Jr. My name is Lynn Hanley, and I have a sixth grader at Gregory and a third grader at Klaus School. We as a cloud community believe that closing Klaus School violates boundary committees 7 and 10, criteria 7 and 10. It would create transportation concerns and could jeopardize student safety. If Klaus were closed, our students would need to be bused to school in the midst of a national bus driver shortage or if the district increases its busing radius to two miles, which has been proposed as a solution to busing problems, our students would have to walk across school, walk to school, across four lanes of traffic on either Naper Plainfield Road or 95th Street, which would pose a significant safety risk to Klaus students. Even if busing were to be secured, there would still be transportation headaches. Springbrook School, to which many Klaus students would be sent, was designed as a walking school and has no bus lane. Adding bus service and increased traffic from parents dropping off and picking up their students would create significant congestion around the school at the start and end of the school day and could create safety hazards for students walking to Springbrook. We believe that both Clow and Springbrook students should get to, could get to school more safely if Clow were allowed to remain open. We also fail to understand why the district has not explored other funding solutions, including bond referendum or tax rate referendum to generate the funding needed for construction in elementary schools on the district's north side. We believe that all students, not just those in our neighborhood, should be able to attend school where they already feel connected in buildings with adequate and flexible space and safe routes to and from school. Why isn't the district exploring these options rather than proposing the closure of our neighborhood school? Why are we considering closing schools that have all of the things we want for kids on the north side, including adequate classroom space, flexible learning spaces, safe transportation routes, and teachers who already know and love them, rather than generating the revenue needed to build those on the north side of town? Or why aren't we finding other places to cut costs before taking the drastic step of closing a school? For all of these reasons, we propose that Clow and other elementary schools remain open while the district looks for alternative solutions to fix crowding issues in other parts of the district. Thank you. I have some um, printed copies of some of our comments to distribute to the board. Okay, Jose Leon Jr. Jose will be followed by Liliana Ramirez. Uh, good evening, my name is Jose Leon. I am the father of a student, a future student, and a past student of Clown Elementary. Now I had a lot of numbers I was gonna throw out their studies, etc. But one thing that came to mind for me was what did we do wrong? If it's not broken, why fix it? We just celebrated students. We have a school that's ranked number one, Cloud that's ranked number 54, and I'm sure the other entry schools, I'm sorry, I don't know the ranking, but I'm sure they're up there. But yet we're closing schools. That doesn't really make sense to me. Cloud is in a thriving community that has maintained it at a high and healthy capacity that has ensured and given our children a great teaching environment and education. We want our kids together with their friends, in their community, as it should be. Once again, we did nothing wrong. What concerns me is that you all knew that closing schools was not going to be a popular option. Closing schools like Clow and the rest of the elementary schools here present, represented is never going to be met with support or backing from the communities. And yet you are still keeping that option open and on the table. Families, children, and communities alike will be affected negatively. There is no positive to take from closing schools, none whatsoever. Once again, we did nothing wrong. I thank you for your service in our children's education, especially during these tough and trying times. 
You have been forced to confront and make some difficult and at times very unpopular decisions to do what's best for our children and your education. But I must say, I'm extremely disappointed and saddened to be standing here today to see that we have two options on the tables here today. One where schools are being closed and the other where they are not. It's not a tough decision to make. We shouldn't have to tell you that closing our schools is not what we want. When I was coming up with my kids, and this is why I'm standing here today speaking, why I've been going around schools, passing out flyers, I do it for my kids. But I want you to look at the kids here today present, from all the elementary schools present here today, to say not to close their school. I already went to school, I graduated. So your decision is not just gonna impact us, but more importantly, it's gonna impact them. And I want you to look at them and see them and hear them. Unfortunately, they can't vote. We do. So I want you to please, and I'm gonna end with this because I don't want to take too much time. Hear them. Please, Donahue, speaker's them. time is up. Sorry, Represent your them. time's up. Thank Liliana you. Ramirez. Liliana, Liliana will be followed by Paul Casco. Casco. Dear board members, Dr. Tally, Ms. Dinah, and all attendees, first of all, thank you for everything, especially for listening to us, the parents. We are the voice of our children. My name is Liliana Ramirez. I'm a resident of Welch Elementary Community. I'm a wife, I'm a mother, a bilingual preschool teacher, a Latino immigrant, a member of a diverse household, Mexican and Colombian. On Tuesday, September 28, 2021, Illinois State Board of Education announced a hundred million grant to support social, emotional, and mental health of students and educators. A state superintendent of education, Dr. Carmen Ayala said, Students and the educators do not leave their trauma at the door when they come to school. Trauma and stress change our brains and affects the way that we interact with everyday life. If all that money was allocated, there must be identif an identified issue among our children and educators. I'm going to give you an example, very simple. Last week, a high school music teacher came to Scotland Middle School as they do every year to check on kids and encourage them to allow music to continue in their lives in high school. I love music program. When the teacher asked the students to raise their hands if they were going to attend Wabansi Valley, none raise their hand. Then she asked, what about Niqua? None raise their hand. Why do you think this happened? Our kids are stressed. Their anxiety levels are increasing as time passes by. And there is not a clear future for them, yes, it's not a future for them yet for the year 21, 22. We are just a couple months away for our middle school kids to begin choosing what they want in high school and what they are going to be doing. I appreciate the social emotional lessons once every one, two or three weeks or using the second step curriculum. Let's first allow them to obtain what they need to heal from an ongoing pandemic. That's why we are wearing masks. And be successful, not only for our children in learning, Ms. Donahue, but to our speaker's teachers. time has ended. Thank, Thank you. you. Paul Casca, followed. Followed by Bhargavi Ganja Daharan. Good afternoon. My name is Paul Casco. I am a student of Niqua Valley High School, a graduate of Welch Elementary, and am currently attending my freshman freshman year. I'm sorry. It honestly feels like eighth grade was yesterday with these online classes and all. <laughs> anyway, 
I'm Paul Casco, Welch, Niqua, freshman year. The idea of Welch graduates moving on to a Bonzi impacts me as a student in that without the convenience that Niqua Valley High School provides, many of my typical daily activities would be impossible. For example, football. Personally, I am proud to have had the pleasure of representing Niqua in eight football games since the beginning of the season. However, it strikes me that the idea of Welch graduates moving on to a Bonzi would render me unable to participate in these events. To me, football is more than just a job or even a club. Football is a place that I know I can truly express myself on the field. Practice, at least, let's be honest, the parts where I'm not running, is a fantastic environment to be in and something that I honestly look forward to. However, without the option of being able to walk home, due to the fact that Niqua is a 30 minute walk away and Wabonzi is a 90 minute walk crossing two major roads, any opportunity at all to participate in football practice and football as a whole would be stripped away from me. And as a result, so would my outlet for hard work dedication, physical activity, and free expression. One of the biggest changes for me in the transition from middle school to high school was the start time of classes. Already, I have to wake up around five o'clock in order to get on the bus at 6.40. So I can't imagine the stress it would produce to have to wake up and board a bus going to a school even further away. As much as I wish it were true, I unfortunately cannot dedicate all of my time to academics. As many of you can understand, I value the time after school that I have to dedicate to not only my studies and extracurriculars, but also to my family, leisure, and speaking with those that I love. Unfortunately, the impact that Welch graduates moving on to Obanzi would have on my life would be coming home late and going to bed early. Not only would I have a longer commute home due to after school activities and distance, but I would actually have to end my day earlier due to the bus coming sooner in the morning. The time after school that I dedicate towards homework, the time after school I dedicate towards spending time with my family, the time after school I dedicate towards interacting with those that I love would all be reduced. I'm confident that I'm not the only student in Niqua that holds these concerns. I, of course, am not the only one whose walk home from after school activities would be taken away by this idea. Neither am I the only one whose day would be cut short by an earlier yet longer bus commute. From the perspective of a student, football player, and person directly impacted by this, I cannot in good faith say that Welch graduates moving on to Obanzi provides reasonable, equitable experience at each school, and certainly not at Nequa Valley High School. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And that, the next speaker is Bhargavi Gajajaharan, and followed by Asa Nirmal. Good evening, board members and committee members. I'm a Mission Work Subdivision resident of Welch community in Naperville. I'm here to express my concern about the boundary exercise underway, which breaks our community and neighborhood. I want to focus on virtual boundary that runs through my backyard and splits our still water and mission works. Me and my backyard member, neighbor, moved in on the same day. We had a home ceremony on the same day. My boys are going to the same school. His, her boys are going to the same school. They are in second grade, fifth grade, sixth and seventh grade. They all share the same bus stop. We share our numbers for emergency contact for our kids at school. We carpool every day after and school programs for clubs and games at school. With the new proposal and an option one, they will be put in a difficult situation and they will be put it in the different schools too. It's like defriend them emotionally and socially. I feel it's incorrect. As a parent, I like to support them, for encourage them, for building their friendship. We all know Stillwater is the only subdivision Mission Works share boundary with. And Stillwater is not a gated community. We share their boundary with them. By taking the Mission Works from rest of the other Welsh community, will make our kids socially isolated. In option one, Mission Works and Aero Estates are the only two subdivisions that got moved out of Welch and Nikwa School. Again, I have to say this, we are living within a two mile radius. Unlike other communities, there is no physical separation between our still and Mission Works community. People who live nearby Welch know about this. By taking Mission Works and Aero from current Welch community as proposed in option one will not solve the overcrowded crowded issue in North. Our kids build the current Welch community like Beehive. I request the sub respected board members not to support or encourage any proposal that throws stone at it. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. 
next speaker is Ashtha Nirmal, followed by Liz Ben Hauer. Good evening, board members. My name is Asta Nirmal, and I'm a senior at Niqua Valley High School. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you for creating such a safe learning environment for me for the past three years. I've lived in Mission Oaks since third grade, and I'm here to express my concern about the boundary exercise underway. I think as humans, we can all agree that we cherish our sleep dearly. <laughs> and as a high schooler, I can speak from personal experience when I say that we treasure the little sleep that we already get. But what happens to these students who have to wake up even earlier, now that their school is four miles away rather than one? I'm fortunate enough to have spent all of my years at a school that's only 1.5 miles away. But even then, I found myself waking up at 6 a.m. after sleeping at an ungodly hour to catch the bus on time. But don't even get me started on the rush to eat breakfast before the school bus rolled around around 6.30 or 6.40. Now I want you to imagine how much earlier these future students will have to wake up now that they'll be attending Wabanzi Valley High School, which is more than two times the distance. There's scientific studies from the American Academy of Pediatrics that elaborates on the devastating effects of lack of sleep on teenagers, such as obesity, depression, anxiety, fatal car accidents, and a lack of concentration, which could lead to a decrease in grades. Not only uh, is the education of students important, but so is their health. Sleep isn't the only factor I'd like to discuss today. It's the decline of resources that will hit 20% of the current Welsh population that is considered low income, who do not have the means to transport themselves whenever and wherever they please. Most of the students that are in the 20% are from our community. And for them, being able to get to school early is the difference between getting breakfast and going to class hungry. In addition, the inability to stay after school to partake in clubs and or meet with teachers can cause a huge gap in their enrichment, not only as a student, but as a person as well. So with this in mind, walkability is crucial for them. And my subdivision, Mission Oaks, was built around Niqua, within walking distance, one mile for some of us. And yet the students would be stripped from their resources. I played two sports for Niqua Valley, swim and water polo. And I was an active member of two clubs as well. When my working parents were not around, it made a huge difference that my school was so close to me, but it would have been impossible if I had attended Wabanzi Valley High School. All in all, this redistricting would hurt the students that District 204 has worked so hard to educate. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. All right. We have Liz Weinhauer, followed by Malaya, Malaya Thomas. Respected 204 board members, my name is Vamsi Koduri and I'm a resident of Naperville. I live in the Stillwater subdivision, where a Welsh Niqua community. I am here to express my concern about the ongoing boundary Excuse exercise. Me. I want to focus on the holistic Excuse development. Me. Is your name Liz Beinhauer? Yeah. Oh, okay. Is that okay? Yeah. Should I restart? For the record, yeah. okay. for the record, we need his name. Okay. Can you can you write your name? Sure. Okay. Should I spell it out? Sure. Yeah. V A M S I. Last name Koduri. K O D U R I. No problem. I'll restart. <laughs> Respected 204 board members, my name is Vamsi Koduri and I'm a resident of Naperville. I live in the Stillwater subdivision. We are a Welsh Naqua community. I am here to express my concern about the ongoing boundary exercise. Today, I want to focus on the holistic development of the special needs children. I believe in the abiding faith in the possibilities of this nation. My story is part of the larger American story. It is with that fundamental belief that it is making this country work that I'm presenting my case today. I'm a proud father of an intelligent nine-year-old son who is a special needs child, who's a fourth grade, who's in the wheelchair attending the Welch Elementary School. It is currently an eight-minute bus ride that is secluded, isolated ride at the back of the bus. Maurya, with his rare disorder of heredity 
respiratory spastic paraplegia needs continued physical therapy, occupational, and speech therapies. The potential long bus rides waiting at the traffic lights crossing major intersections means increased travel time that directly translates to increased physical strength that is needed to sit in his wheelchair on the bus. This also means that there is no social interaction for extended periods of time, increasingly pushing him towards negative thought processes. This also means losing focus after he reaches home. This will push scheduled times for his therapies and may even be canceled. All of this means early wake-ups, less time for the homework, less sleep times. Today, according to research, sleep deprivation is a major cause of the health concern among other concerns and is nearing the pandemic levels. Without empathy, there is no progress. Please, I repeat, without empathy, there is no progress. Please let the boundaries be drawn with empathy rather than sharp straight lines that do not unite but divide. We made Stillwater community our home just over a year ago and have narrowed down all options for our special needs child. Let's give that hope to our children with proper dialogue, with proper logical thinking, and by hope we can succeed because this is United States of America. Let's not uproot the fundamental thinking and the hope of my child by not letting him to navigate and experiment the uncharted waters due to the time constraints during the childhood and teenage years. Let's retain the key idea of healthy lifestyle and progress of our children. Finally, the, my favorite line from the book I authored, The Pursuit of the Triumph. In the pursuit of the time, hope always triumphs. I do not take anything for granted. I do not take tonight for granted. However, with the strength, support, and spirit of our community right behind me, I sincerely hope IPSD will consider my request. God bless America. The next speaker is Malaya Thomas, followed by Tracy Skindizer. Hi, my name is Malaya Thomas, and next school year I will have four students who attend all three level schools of all three levels of school here in District 204: two fourth graders at Welch, a seventh grader at Scullin, and a freshman at Nequa. Currently, Boundary Three, con Boundary Concept Three is the only one that guarantees continuity of attendance for my children. As active parents in our children's educational experience, my husband and I have been diligent in fostering relationships with the faculty at both Welch and Scullin, relationships that have aided our children greatly as they embrace the natural transitions from level to level while also adjusting to the frontier of a post-COVID world. Another point of concern is that my children and others have medical concerns that impact their respiratory systems and functions, as well as allergies, food allergies. Currently, I am able to get to my children and provide them with respiratory relief within 15 minutes or less. If they are further away, that time can nearly double or more, depending on how far I have to go and how far that puts us away from their medical providers. As parents of school-aged children, we were intentional in our choice of Naperville and IPSD 204 when we relocated here from out of state in 2019. Our concern is not whether one school is better than the other, but what makes sense for all of the multifaceted considerations for our children and our family. Um, another concern, a final concern is RSP's demonstration of bias in their presentations and communication, written and verbal, in the way they label categories throughout their slide presentations. Um, instead of using terms, they use terms like single family home, single family attached, single family detached, and apartments. And that supports an erroneous perception that people in apartments are less valuable than people in single family homes whereas the term multifamily homes evens the playing field. So that's one thing that I saw concerning. RSP needs to be mindful of the bias in their language. And when I come back in November, we'll discuss that even further. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Next speaker is Tracy Skindizer, followed by Huang Tang Tan. Hello, school board members. My name is Tracy Skinzer, and I live in River Run in South Naperville. I have three current students in the district, a seventh grader at Crone and a third and fourth grader at Graham Elementary. We moved to this area over three years ago 
almost entirely based on the reputation of schools here in Naperville alone. Graham Elementary was a huge reason why we settled in this part of Naperville. Graham has always been a highly rated school, is currently the seventh best elementary school in all of Illinois, and produces students with high test scores, is incredibly diverse, and provides a strong sense of community. I'm here this evening to talk about the growth we are seeing at Graham today and why we expect this to continue in the future. As the current PTA president at Graham, I have seen firsthand the significant growth in the enrollment just in the last year alone. The number of new students at school this year is up almost 100 people, which is close to a 30% growth in new enrollments. In addition, the preschool numbers are up as well. We now have seven different preschool classes at Graham. Were you to come visit our school in person, which we encourage you to do, you would see we do not have one empty classroom. Every single room at Graham is in use. If you combine the current Graham enrollment with the preschool, something that RSP has yet to do, you would see our school is at a 60% utilization. If our numbers continue to grow at this rate, Graham will be at a 75% utilization in just two years, which is above the district goal of 70. This growth at Graham goes hand in hand with the activity we have seen in the housing market. In the last 13 months, River Run has sold over 70 homes, representing a 10% turnover of our neighborhood. During the same time period, the High Meadow neighborhood, also feeding into Graham, has seen 41 homes sold, which is a 6% turnover of their neighborhood. Due to the COVID pandemic, we have seen the largest migration of people leaving the cities for highly ranked school districts like Indian Prairie in over 100 years. In addition, a quick poll of our neighborhoods shows that almost 30 households in River Run and 20 in High Meadow expect to sell in the next few years. Based on these responses, we ex expect that the current rate of housing turnover and the growth we have seen at Graham is not slowing down. With the continued activity of the housing market and rising enrollment at Graham, we see no justification for closing Graham or any other 204 school. In fact, we can see that with continued growth in enrollment, doing so would lead to overcrowding of other schools in the South, likely resulting in the need to evaluate and redistrict 204 again in just a few short years. To avoid such a situation and a significant disruption to our students' lives, please remove concept one from consideration and look for a more equitable concept for all our students. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Nang Tan, followed by Sab Sabra Ramakrishna. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Shubhadra Ramakrishnan, and my daughter is a third grader at Clow Elementary. And thank we, you for your time this evening. With the proposed we, we plan. I have missed one speaker. Oh, have we? 17? Uh, no. Number 16. Oh, what's her name? Hunang Tan. Yes. Oh, sorry about, sorry about that. Uh, good evening, everyone. I am a resident from Mission, Mission Oaks, and I am standing here to express my concern uh, about Concept 1, which will take away the kids in our community from Welch. Uh, I have three kids, and um, uh, one is in grade 5, and another two is in grade 1. And next year, my oldest kid will go to the middle school, and according to the Concept 1, she will be uh, in the still middle school, which is the west and the other two will be go to the Owen, which is in the east. And uh, my daughter now, she is attending the uh, school choice every Tuesday morning, and uh, she want to continue this activity next year. And uh, uh, one of my other two kids, um, he is a special needs kid. Um, and I, I, want, I want him to uh, attend as much as possible activities to improve his uh, social skills. So it is really difficult for me if um, uh, if they have overlap uh, activities in the morning or in the afternoon activities. So um, I have to drive uh, 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 all of the kids to uh, totally different uh, opposite uh, directions, and one is even like five miles away from my home. So Welch is so close to our home, and I. I do understand uh, why the, uh, our school uh, district want to do the reboundary, but I don't understand why um, need to exclude us, exclude the kids from the uh, 87 uh, north side of the 87th street uh, from Welch, 
mm, our case is not a big population. I mean, mm, we can keep, uh, mm, do you, mm, it, it is considered to revise the concept one. And um, I want to show the flyer my, uh, my kids made. And um, uh, she, she made this with uh, her friend to show uh, her cells. And uh, she, she writes, we can wa uh, walk to Welch. And she also said, um, uh, please help us stay closer to school, not farther. So, um, so I just uh, want to say um, we welcome any community and subdivisions to, to the Welch Nikwa education track, but just want to keep the current Welch students as they are. Um, I moved to uh, Michigan for um, many years, and I really appreciate and uh, impressed by your teamwork, uh, make our school district, uh, district better and better. So this time I believe your team will find a better reasonable and feasible plan to solve the problems and achieve the goals with the, uh, the least influence uh, on our kids. Thank this you. This is Danny, whose speaker's time has ended. The next speaker is Sabadra Ramakrishna, followed by Pooja Katha Diana. Yeah. Okay. Let's try this again. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Subhadra Ramakrishnan, and my daughter is a third grader at Clough Elementary. Uh, and thank you for your time this evening. So, with the proposed plan that closes schools, we are truly worried about the impact on children, both from repurposed schools and the receiving institutions. This concept does not align with two of the boundary criteria: one is keeping neighborhoods intact, and two is minimizing students impacted. Several credible studies conducted even before the pandemic show that closing a school has a significant negative impact on children's performance, psychology, as well as the community as a whole. Even studies that show benefits of school closures acknowledge that these benefits are limited to high-performing students. Students at risk of academic difficulties are adversely affected due to the reduced number of accessible alternatives upon school closures. Perhaps the most relevant study for us this evening is the 2018 uh, study by Gordon et al., which looked at recent school closures in Chicago, which closed 47 elementary schools and one high school. These researchers showed that the effects of school closures were largely unanticipated by the policymakers. Specifically, interviews with affected students and staff revealed major challenges with logistics, relationships, and school divisions. They report that, open quote, closed school staff and students came into welcoming schools grieving and in some cases resentful that their schools closed while others stayed open. Welcoming school staff said they were not adequately supported to serve the new population and to address resulting divisions, close quote. Furthermore, the Chicago study clearly mentions that closing a well-performing school impacts students' achievement negatively, not just in the short term, but which lasts for several years afterwards. Closing a school is a drastic measure which disrupts stability, puts some groups of students further behind, and severs important relationships with teachers, peers, therapists, special ed teachers, librarians. From an SIBC standpoint, student impacted by boundary, cha boundary change, the plan that closes schools impacts 32% of elementary school students. But please note, 100% of Klaus school students are impacted. Even as it stands now, the concept that repurposes schools impacts 860 more students compared to the concept that keeps all schools open. We suggest that instead of quantifying SIBC through a single incomplete metric of student displacement, we request the Boundary Committee look closely at parameters that can be easily obtained and are known to directly impact students. For example, student performance, school performance, age, PTA involvement, class size and we request that these be used as covariates to inform RSP's SIBC projections. What, uh, the way it stands now is incomplete. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> the next speaker is Pooja Kadya Dia and followed by Katie Maxon. Hello, good evening board members, Dr. Tally. I'm a resident of Naperville, Mission Oaks community and I've been there for the past 15 years and I have set up roots there in the neighborhood, raising a kid, forming friendships within the Welch Nikwa community. We do a lot of activities as a family. We, around the Welch and Nikwa schools, we walk, we bike, as it is a very short distance, not requiring crossing of any major intersections. I think as everybody has been expressing the concerns about boundary, I'm here to express the same uh, regarding the same. The proposed change in the concept one 
would have an adverse effect on students' well-being in the three aspects which are vital to their development. Their social skills, their emotional skills, and their academic skills. The key thing is about the transportation, and I think the couple of Niqua students, Niqua Welch students who came here have already spoken about the impact that it has because of the transportation, which is going to be a major challenge for the future students if they have to cross these major intersections, and that will make their wake-up times even earlier. Longer bus rides, longer car rides. This will lead to very less time for homework, later sleep times, and it could even impact in declining of their grades. This will also impact in their before and after school activity participation. My son, who is very much interested in all the sports activities, likes to play football, would like to want to get into track, and I am very concerned that with this change, it is going to be very difficult or very discouraging for him to be able to participate if it's going to cause a lot of commute time for him as well as less time to do the academic activities. The stress of commute not only impacts this, it's also uh, the major concern is about the route that they have to cross, which is the Route 59, which is a major safety hazard. So. Also, the kids who would be going uh, into the high school would be the one who had just learned driving, and they would also be crossing this Route 59, which is, again, a very concerning thing. In addition, the kids who have grown up together, going to Welch and playing together, would, and going to the same schools currently, and intended to go to the same schools, will not be going to schools. This sudden change in the environment will make it harder for the students to make key connections with their peers, their teachers, and then unnecessary adding to their stress. Thus, I sincerely urge the board to consider all these aspects in the reboundary exercise, keeping our children's well-being in mind, keep the current Welch and Equa community as one, and do not isolate Mission Oaks and the communities north of 87 as an island out of its overall Welch and Equa community. Thank you. Thank you. We have Katie Maxson, followed by Becky Thorne. Hello, my name is Katie Maxson, and I'm a parent of a current sophomore at Matia Valley High School. I'm here with a group of parents with a request. First, we'd like to thank the board for all of your hard work over the last few years. We know one of your next major tasks you must undertake is evaluating district boundaries. While this rarely makes anyone happy, we know it has to be done. But how it is implemented is just as important as where the lines fall. We are requesting that the board consider allowing rising juniors and seniors a choice to stay at their current high school if they desire. 204 residents are lucky to have high quality schools that they love and that they don't want to leave once they start there. This is not just an emotional attachment, but one full of practical and logistical considerations, in particular as students move to the higher grade levels. Thanks to COVID, my daughter, as well as her peers, lost her eighth grade graduation, as well as most chances to make quality connections and relationships during her entire freshman year. This year, she's working hard to adjust by getting involved in sports and developing relationships with her teachers, coaches, counselors, and other students. She and her classmates are taking on new opportunities and getting involved with organizations they hope to lead themselves in a year or two. But under all the proposals drafted so far, redistricting would send her to Wabonzi. The effort to build those relationships and connections would have to start all over in an environment with students who have had a year or two to build them and with only two years remaining. Junior year is also critical to the college entrance process. Her class will struggle with counselor relationships for advice, for teacher relationships for recommendations, and obtaining those critical leadership roles in clubs and on sports teams. The social emotional impact of this change could be extreme for some students. The SEL curriculum is a priority of the district with weekly lessons on various topics to help students manage this essential element of their overall education. Serious consideration of this impact will help the board walk the talk when it comes to the mental health of 204 students. We are just asking for these students who have already started building these connections to get the choice to continue what they've worked so hard to start. COVID was beyond the control of the board and the district, but redistricting and how it is implemented is within your control. Please consider allowing grandfathering for rising upperclassmen. Thank you. Thank you. Becky Thorne. Good evening. My name is Becky Thorne, and my children, who are in third grade and kindergarten, attend Graham Elementary School. I'm also the vice president of our PTA. 
My family moved to Naperville from Chicago nine years ago when we were pregnant with our first child. We chose 204 for its wonderful reputation and top-ranking schools. Our entire community was in utter shock the first time we heard about the boundary proposal to close any school, but especially our beloved Graham. In Chicagoland, closing schools is something we hear of happening in urban underfunded, underserved, and underperforming communities, not in top-ranked school districts like 204. I want to specifically address the devastating impact that closing our school will have on our children's mental health. I'm a pediatric speech therapist in the community and have seen firsthand the toll navigating life in this pandemic world has taken on our children. No child is immune to this. We as a society like to speak of how resilient our children are. After living through their third school year with the COVID-19 pandemic, I'm here to say that no child is as resilient as they once were. I would bet that every parent in this room has had a child struggle with some form of mental health since March 2020. This pandemic has created loneliness, anxiety, stress, depression, and overall instability for our children. Closing their much-loved elementary school, which has been a safe, supportive, and stable home for them, will most certainly cause extreme disruption to their lives and will wreak havoc on their mental health. Splitting students up by sending them to two different schools would break up friendships and ruin valuable social autonomy that has been cultivated within our school. It is my understanding that 204 has hired more support staff like social workers in preparation for this school year to deal with growing mental health needs of students. My own daughter has been identified as needing social work services for school-related anxiety for the first time in her school career. Coincidence? I don't think so. Concept one closes her school, tears her apart from her friends, and buses her past two bordering elementary schools, Patterson and Kendall, to go to Bilta that is over two miles away. This makes no sense. If schools are closed, we are letting our children down and creating a very expensive problem for the district by needing to hire even more social workers, school psychologists, interventionists, and TAs to handle the mental health, emotional, and behavioral problems it will create. A quick Google search leads to countless research articles about the association between school closures and child mental health outcomes. One recent study by Holarenko et al. that was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association from September stated that youth may be uniquely susceptible to negative mental health outcomes if they are experiencing pandemic-related disruptions in schooling. Their analysis suggested that emotional difficulties accounted for the largest proportion of mental health challenges. Closing schools during a pandemic is not the, in the best interest of our children. It is like kicking them when they're already down. I am requesting that closing schools be taken off the table completely from any proposal. Our children's mental health and well-being depends on it. Thank you. Is there time? No. no. All right. I'm sorry. That concludes our 60 minutes of public speaking. I will tell you that everyone is always welcome to write to the board. Um, we have an, another meeting in a couple weeks that people are welcome to come and speak at. Our board is very diligent in reading your email. Uh, we have been getting a lot of it, but um, I can tell you every person up here reads what you write. So you're welcome to do that. So thank you. All right, we're going to move on to the next topic. Our next topic is the. Excuse me, if you guys are leaving, we still have a meeting to take Please place. Leave so if you could quietly. All right, exit. we Thank now you. move to our consent agenda and superintendent report. We will start with the superintendent report. Ms. Donahue, thank you. Members of the Board of Education and Indian Prairie Community, I will start my comments by sharing some sad news. One of our students passed away over the weekend. Out of privacy concerns, I will not reveal the name of the student. However, I will ask that we take a moment of silence now for reflection and contemplation about our students. Thank you. We have started the test to stay program that I mentioned in prior Board of Ed meetings. We are piloting with four elementary schools, Brookdale, Kendall, Steck, and May Watts. 
Under test to stay, students are masked and exposed to someone positive in school will be able to stay in school if tested on the first, third, fifth, and seventh day after exposure and remain negative throughout the testing process. Information was sent home to parents at those four schools to sign up for this voluntary program. Once we see we can implement the program successfully, we will open the program to more schools. I commend our nurses for the work they will, be, they will have to do because they will be conducting the swab tests with the students. The Illinois State Board of Education in collaboration with the Illinois Education Association and the Illinois Federation of Teachers created a virtual instructional coach and building mentor program. The program which started last year offers novice educators comprehensive wraparound professional support for teachers. The state has approximately 230 virtual coaches and I'm very happy to say that approximately a third of them are Indian Prairie teachers who are serving as coaches. Both coaches and those being coached have expressed how this program has enhanced their teaching. I'm very proud that Indian Prairie is leading the way in supporting new teachers, not only in our district, but across the state. And I want to thank all the people who are part of Team IPF for running on wa our walking yesterday. It was wonderful to, to be part of the Sea of Yellow yesterday, raising funds for the school program. Great shout outs to Alicia Johnson, Executive Director of IPF, and Heidi Holm, Administrative Assistant for IPF, for all the work they did in organizing cajoling donations from donors and ensuring the success of the program. The funds raised will support many programs that we have in our schools. I also want to praise those who came out to support the runners. I hope I don't forget anyone, but, I was, as, but as I was walking the 5K, I saw and was cheered on by Granger, White Eagle, Steps, Matia Track students, and Brookdale. It's one thing to come out early to run. It's another to come out early to cheer on those in the race. This community event shows all the great things about our community, about our people, and about who we are. I'll return the meeting to you, Ms. Donahue. Thank you. Next, we move to our consent agenda items. Please identify yourself as you make a motion. I need a motion or for approval of consent agenda items D through F. Make a motion that the Board of Education approve consent agenda items D through F as presented. Is there a second? Natasha Grover, second. Any discussion? Jeannie, will you please call the roll? Mr. Rising. Yes. Ms. Grover. Yes. Ms. Fazdick. Yes. Mr. Karubis. Yes. Ms. Deming. Aye. Ms. Jane. Yes. Ms. Donahue. Aye. The motion passes. Next, we move to our action items. I need a motion to approve the resolution recognizing October 2021 as National Principals Month. I move that the Board of Education approve the resolution recognizing October 2021 as National Principals Month. I second. Ms. Grover, um, whereas the Illinois Principal Association has declared the month of October 2021 as National Principals Month in coordination with the efforts of the National Association of Elementary School Principals, the American Association of School Administrators, and the National Association of Secondary School Principals working with the U.S. Congress to designate National Principals Month and resolution thereof. Whereas the vision, dedication, and determination of a principal provides the mobilizing force behind any school reform effort, whereas principals are expected to be educational visionaries, instructional leaders, assessment experts, disciplinarians, community builders, public relation experts, budget analysts, facility managers, special program administrators, and guardians of various legal, contractual, and policy mandates and initiatives, as well as being entrusted with the educational and development of young people, the most valuable resource, Whereas principals will play a vital role in successful implementation of the Every Student Succeed Act, ESSA, whereas principals set the academic tone for their schools and work collaborat collaboratively with teachers to develop and maintain high curriculum standards, develop mission statements, and set performance goals and objectives for schools to achieve educational excellence, 
whereas the Indian Prairie Community Units, Community Unit School District 204 recognizes outstanding principals who have succe succeeded in providing high quality learning opportunities for students, as well as their exemplary contributions to the profession. Whereas to honor and recognize the contributions of all school principals and assistant principals at all grade levels to the success of students in Illinois elementary and secondary schools and to encourage residents of Illinois to observe National Principals Month with appropriate ceremonies and activities that promote awareness of school leadership's role in ensuring that every child has access to a high quality education. Be it resolved in honor of the services of all preschool, elementary, middle level, high school principals and Wheatland Academy and STEPS principals and to recognize the importance of their school leadership so that every child has access to a high quality education and to celebrate school leader accomplishments the month of October 2021 is hereby designated in Illinois to be National Principals Month. Any discussion? Jeannie, will you please call the roll? Ms. Fazdick. Yes. Ms. Jane. Yes. Ms. Donahue. Yes. Ms. Grover. Yes. Ms. Deming. Aye. Mr. Rising. Aye. Mr. Krubus. Yes. The motion passes. Now I need a motion to approve the amended 2021-22 school calendar as presented. I move that the Board of Education approves the amended 2021-22 school calendar as presented. Second. Any discussion? Just for clarification, yeah. this was um, because of the voting day, correct, Dr. Talley? Yeah. It's because the primary was moved from March 15th to June 28th. And we had previously had that and day And we off. had previously had that day off, yeah. And all of our, just for clarification, all of our administration and staff uh, are aware of the, um, of the requested change. Yes, that's correct. All right, Jeannie, will you please call the roll? Ms. Jane. Yes. Mr. Rising. Yes. Mr. Karubis. Yes. Ms. Fazdick. Yes. Ms. Deming. Aye. Ms. Grover. Yes. Ms. Donahue. Yes. The motion passes. Next, I need a motion to approve the Board of Education National School Board Association 2021 Annual Conference Estimated Travel Expenses as presented. Make a motion that the Board of Education approve the Board of Education National School Board Association 2021 Annual Conference Estimated Travel Expenses as presented. I second. Any discussion? Jeannie, will you please call the roll? Mr. Rising. Yes. Ms. Jane. Yes. Ms. Fazdick. Yes. Ms. Donahue. Yes. Mr. Krubus. Yes. Ms. Deming. Aye. Ms. Grover. Yes. The motion passes. Lastly, I need a motion to approve the 2021-2022 IASB DuPage Division Executive Committee Slate of Officers as presented. I move that the Board of, Vaca Board of Education approve the 2021-2022 IASB DuPage Division Executive Committee Slate of Officers as presented. I second. Any discussion? This is something that we will be voting on at the DuPage um, meeting this week. So, all right, Jeannie, will you please call the roll? Ms. Fazdick. Yes. Ms. Jane. Yes. Ms. Grover. Yes. Mr. Rising. Yes. Mr. Karubis. Yes. Ms. Deming. Aye. Ms. Donahue. Aye. The motion passes. So next up, we move to our discussion items. And we have the annual recruitment and hiring report presented by Dr. Lewis Lee and Ms. Carrie Beth Harry. Good evening, President Donahue, board members, and Dr. Talley. Thank you for the opportunity to present tonight our annual hiring report. Joining me to present is Carrie Beth Harry, our Director of Human Resources, Ann Cluxton, who is our English and Reading Specialist at Matea Valley High School, and Zoe Williams, a junior at Matea Valley High School. 
For tonight, we will present several topics for discussion. Uh, they will include some of the continued challenges and opportunities uh, that the COVID-19 pandemic has brought about with our efforts. Um, we'll be talking about staffing in the district. We'll also provide an update on the teacher workforce in the state and our district, along with something new called the Illinois Teacher Preparation Program, and also focusing on diversity, not only in our district, but also in the program. We will include some information regarding recruitment efforts in our district, um, and part of that focus will be our Grow Your Own Teacher Program. Staff retention, and finally, uh, we'll provide some information about uh, continued future efforts. At this time, I'm gonna turn it over to our director, uh, Carrie Beth Harry. Thank you, board members and Dr. Talley for allowing us the opportunity to present to you tonight. Last year, we spoke to you about the hiring challenges and opportunities that <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for allowing us the opportunity to present to you tonight. Um, last year, we spoke to you about the hiring challenges and opportunities that the pandemic presented. We still face some of those, but also want to ensure, you, ensure to you that we continue to hire passionate, dedicated, and professional educators and support staff. We're proud of what they've already done in these first few months. You'll see in our data that the overall hiring was back to pre-pandemic levels. The challenge we continue to face is the size of the applicant pools. We're very excited to introduce our 2021-2022 new hire class to you. This diverse group is made up of teachers and administrators who interviewed, were onboarded, and began their careers at 204 as we transitioned from hybrid to full in-person. Some of our new hires student teaching experience was completed solely through remote learning. They are, however, determined to make meaningful con connections with our students and their teaching peers. Establishing connections is the foundation of our recruitment strategy. We attended our scheduled job fairs remotely, but still had authentic conversations with the candidates we met. We're thrilled to be welcoming back 16 204 graduates as teachers in the district. Our goal is to both increase the candidate pool and bring back more 204 grads with our Grow Your Own Teacher program, which we'll explain in, in further detail in the presentation. This slide represents our total staff by FTE and percentage. Our report to you primarily focuses on our teaching staff, staff which is our largest group, but it's also important to note that 25% of our staff is support staff. 5.8% is non-bargaining, and 2.8% is administration. As a reminder, our non-bargaining staff includes OTs and PTs, that's occupational and physical therapists, registered nurses, our technology, business, and HR staff. This year, our total FTE has increased by 52.9 FTE from the beginning of the last school year. This increase primarily uh, is with our licensed staff and was addressed using CARES money to support additional positions. Our classified increases are seen in teaching assistant roles, most notably at the kindergarten level. These positions continue to be hard to fill with a decreasing candidate pool to draw from. This is not a challenge unique to 204, but one that has been felt across the nation and over the last several years. So we know that our students, um, they come from a various socioeconomical, religious, cultural, uh, many other diverse, diverse backgrounds. Uh, we celebrate that diversity within our district. As a district, diversity represents one of the three areas that we are committed to achieving for all of our students. The other two being equity and inclusion. Uh, the definition of diversity that you see on the screen highlights how we are defining this area, and that's to support the social and emo emotional wellness and academic achievement of all of our students. It's important that we also have a workforce that reflects this device, device, yeah, diversity. 
For our purposes in this presentation, we will be focusing on the category of race and ethnicity in our workforce, but you'll also see information regarding gender. Uh, and also when we get to the new Illinois teacher preparation program, also in terms of first time um, entries into the profession. So speaking of this new Illinois educator preparation program, in August 2016, uh, the Illinois State uh, Board of Education embarked on a new system to report and monitor all teacher preparation programs throughout the state. So at the collegiate level, uh, all of uh, any um, student that was entering with the intent on coming out with a licensure, um, all of those programs um, were starting to be monitored in August 2016. The goal of this new, new system was to ensure that all new Illinois teachers are learner ready on day one in the classroom and data is used as a tool for accountability, continuous improvement, and transparency to strengthen teacher preparation statewide for the long term. These goals do align with the State Board of Education's goal that Illinois' diverse student population will have educators who are prepared to, through multiple pathways. ISBE's vision for a robust data collection effort was driven by the need for a better approach to the current process. This new system uh, will provide a critical connection between the state and teacher preparation programs to help facilitate program improvement and provide valuable information to programs, prospective teachers, and potential employers like our school district and the general public overall. The system was developed to be fair, clear, and they developed it based on three principles. The first, uh, that it would fairly measure program performance and provide metrics and pro program context so that it is not biased ag about against programs based on demographics. It would clearly indicate program performance in a way that is understandable to program staff, PK through 12 educators, prospective candidates, and to the general public. And then the third was that it would provide equitable supports to programs based on their context. This chart really kind of shows a um, nice graphic of from 2016 through 2020, the steps that the state took through this teacher preparation program. Um, as any good um, program design would take in, they first started with a steering committee in August of 2016. Then they began with a mini pilot of educator preparation programs throughout the state. Uh, there are currently 52. They started with 36, which represented 76% of teaching candidates in the state. Uh, they expanded that mini pilot to a full pilot, and that started in the fall of 2017. And then from 2018 to 2019, they actually went to a statewide pilot for a year or two. And finally, with last year, uh, they actually uh, replaced um, the uh, program reporting that we reported on last year with this new annual program reporting that we'll show just in a moment. And this data was first made available in the winter of 2020, uh, about a couple of months after the data we presented to you. And on an ongoing basis, it will be available to the public on the website uh, that they have designed. We know that Illinois College and University Educator Preparation Programs prepare individuals to serve as teachers in the diverse classrooms of the state's public schools. Uh, these state-approved programs are provided at the undergraduate level, graduate, and post-baccalaureate levels, and in both traditional and alternative formats to accommodate the wide variety of experiences that prospective teachers may have before they enter the field. Um, this demand for rigorous preparation programs that produce strong, learner-ready teachers is high due to the number of vacant classrooms that are throughout the state of Illinois. So again, we have 52. Uh, institutions of higher education, you may remember in previous uh, programs we call those IHEs, um, that includes 715 preparation actual programs and then 49 areas of endorsement and that's throughout the state of Illinois. So if we were to zoom in a little bit on that graphic, uh, again on the left it shows the, the new annual preparation um, uh, program reporting and on the right was the old way in which they're going to continue to do is which is the um, continuous reporting to the U.S. Department of Education under the Title II data. It's really the enrollment, 
the enrolled student enrollment piece that you will see is the biggest difference from how we report. Uh, what they've really done is the old way in which we were looking at things was we were looking at the total number of, of students that were in that year. So regardless of uh, how many students entered into the fall, they counted the sophomores, the juniors, and the seniors uh, in total uh, and didn't even count how many were exiting. We always reported those numbers separately. The new program reporting that we'll show in just a minute on the next graphic, all they're doing is, is focusing on that year one cohort, how many students have entered for that year, and then they're still gonna separate out how many students have exited. You will see that the numbers appear lower, and that's because they're not counting who's still in the, uh, enrolled in the college. Um, I think it's gonna be a more accurate way of showing things, a truly um, good understanding of how many are coming in as, as also as how many are coming out in the same year. So this graphic really kind of shows that number. Before we get to the right, I do want to just comment on our current um, number of teachers, licensed teachers, um, in the state of Illinois. And that number increased slightly from last year when we reported, it was about 129,000. It's now just over 130,000. 77% of, of educators in the state are female, and then 82% are white, and that has increased um, slightly as we reported uh, from last year. So again, by gender and by race, um, we are not seeing a improvement uh, towards greater diversity uh, throughout the state of Illinois. <clears throat> now, if we were to look at the new annual program reporting, again, you remember they started uh, doing the pilot back in August of 2016, and so some of this data is included uh, from that initial pilot. And so as you look at that, for example, if we were to focus on the year 2017 to 2018, the number enrolled you saw um, was at the bottom end of, of what was continues to be a dip, even if we were to go back um, all the way to 2010, as we reported last year, we continued to see a decline. So it was just over 4,000 statewide, 4,000 individuals entering into a teacher preparation program statewide. And then the, the completion level was just under 5,000. And again, the reason for that difference is you did have, it's not counting the number of individuals that were still present in the school at that time. We are starting to see a gradual rise and that number in 2018 to 2019 of just under 5,500 is the first rise that we've seen probably within the past 15 years. Uh, that is a good thing. We hope that we have kind of bottomed out here and that we are starting to see um, an increase in what will be to come. When we report the old Title II data, we were always two years behind. Uh, this will put us only a year. And again, we feel like this new um, teacher preparation program will give us more accurate information and, and more timely information. Um, before I go on, it's important to also just remember that this um, data, they, I know we've had questions in the past regarding how many, are, um, how many are going into high school, how many are middle school. Uh, at this time, they still have not distinguished that data for us. Uh, but I think we're hopeful that with this new program, they can start to delineate that uh, for us. So again, we don't know of, for example, of the 5,000 that were completed um, in 2017, 2018, what majority of that was. Uh, so we still don't have that data yet, but we hope that that will start to change. Um, again, this data is all available to the public too. Uh, this is overall candidate demographics during the uh, five years of reporting that they currently have. Um, it will not be a surprise to see, again, it, it mirrors what we just reported in terms of the state data, that 76.5% um, um, of people entering the programs are um, primarily female. This uh, next slide breaks it down by race. Uh, again, 74% are white. Um, the next largest demographic group uh, that is presented is our, our Hispanic group at just under 11%, followed um, by our African Americans at just over 5%, and then um, unknown, uh, obviously people who are, did not uh, uh, 
uh, make a choice uh, is around 3.7%. And then this final slide is very interesting because as I mentioned earlier, um, it sort of looks at uh, from a different lens in, in terms of first generation college students who actually are entering this program and again those who are Pell Grant eligible and some of you are, are familiar with the Pell Grants uh, in terms of just um, how it works in the college setting. Pell Grants are state grants that are eligible and that's based on income and other factors that they take into to account. So why is diversifying our staff so important? Well. There is, as you've seen, there's been no real significant change in the diversity of the teaching workforce in Illinois. And if we were to trace that, that really goes back to 2002. Uh, so it's, it's, we're approaching um, 20 years uh, that there's really been no significant change. We continue to be very concerned um, about the decrease in the number of students who are attending universities to teach. We hope, again, that that decrease has, has started to bottom out and we'll, we'll continue to see an increase uh, as we just reported, as well as the low number of teaching candidates of color at many universities. So again, as you saw that, we're just under 5,000 uh, that enrolled, but uh, if we were to look at one demographic group, for example, our African American, that means 5% of that 4,000 are African American, which accounts, again, to uh, 200 uh, throughout the state. So that's for all 857 school districts to look at. Um, so it, it, it continue. while we know this is a step in the right direction, and we, we, I think this, you'll find this, this program and reporting much better, uh, we know that we still have challenges ahead. We also want to continue to hire the best and most highly qualified candidates while at the same time trying to increase the diversity of our workforce. With that, I want to talk a little bit about our, our district data. We talked a little bit about the state. This is just our district data. Uh, pleased to report again that uh, we had a 22.3% of our new licensed hires were persons of color. So that class that, um, that Carrie Beth is going to talk a little bit more about toward the end of the presentation, 22% um, uh, of that incoming class were persons of color. That, that's to be celebrated. We still have more work to do. But the reason for the celebration, that's now a two-year trend of double-digit growth. So we want to celebrate that. Um, the second being just the overall percentage of licensed staff of color has increased slightly to 12%. Uh, this is an increase from a previous year. So um, we still have work to do, but we're going in the right direction. And then 50% of our administrative hires with this new class were persons of color. That does match our data from last year. Uh, so again, something that we continue to see a positive trend. This again is just our district data. Just a snapshot, if we were to compare teachers to students, we know that having just an enrollment of just over 26,000 students, uh, we are a majority minority district. So what does that mean? Again, 60% of students uh, of our district is students of color. Now, uh, how does that compare to, we talked about having a diverse workforce that reflects our students. Uh, again, for us, 88% are, um, are, are, are white and so, um, this graphic on the right just shows we continue to, to um, want to uh, do our best to get to a place where our teacher workforce does reflect our student body. We are challenged though, again, with the state data and those that are entering the workforce to get there. Uh, but we are gonna talk about some additional efforts that we're, we're taking, uh, both current and partnership, uh, to also help to change uh, some of that dynamic. With that being said, let's talk a little bit about recruitment. Uh, and this leads really to our strategies uh, for recruitment. Um, while sharing information of our reviews uh, this year, this is an area that we will be sharing more, uh, some of our successes, but also what we believe are going to be continued opportunities as we operate still in this changed in-person environment. Um, it's good to say, to, to take note of that change. Last year we were talking virtual, so we are in person and it's still changed, but uh, it, it allows us for some, some different, different things to take place. So our class of new hires uh, for 2021 through 2022, um, as Carrie Beth mentioned, we, that number combined gave us 122 licensed new hires. Uh, as mentioned earlier, over 22% of this class were persons of color. 
Some of the highlights in this slide also show that nearly 44% of the new hire class of 2021 is at the high school level, and nearly 60% are within their early years of teaching with three years or less experience. And then we also know that over half of this new recruit class does have an advanced deg degree. This is also the first class that was brought in post remote environment for orientation, so we were able to do this in person. We'd like to thank at this time our Department of Professional Development, Curriculum, Instruction and Technology, IPEA, and our Human Resources team. Uh, this is a collaborative effort among all these groups to welcome in our new teachers. Uh, we were able to sit in on several groups as they went through orientation, and the successful onboarding of this class would not have been possible without the collaboration of, of all the departments uh, that are critical uh, to this new group. So some of the strategies. Um, we're gonna hear a little bit about Grow Your Own, uh, and, and we actually uh, have um, a student here that's mm -hmm. been able to experience that, so we're excited to hear from her um, in just a moment and also a leadership team member. Um, but again, as we talked about, you know, how has recruiting changed? What are some things that we're able to do? Um, so both in the short term and long term, um, we know that while we're challenged with uh, some of the data that we saw, we don't wanna stop. Um, I continue to receive and work with some of our parents in our district who um, have shared with us contacts for um, HBCUs um, that I have reached out to directly and we're working with to try to increase the number of direct partnerships that we can establish with them to really intensify our efforts in trying to get um, um, interested candidates here. Uh, as I said before, uh, you know, sometimes one of our challenges is not only in terms of where we're at and our size, but also weather. Um, you know, Sometimes people in, in other parts of our country don't see Chicago as a, a great warm area. Uh, so we, we, we continue to work on that. Um, you know, just recently, we just uh, were able to, we were pleased to take part in a job fair run by the Naperville uh, Works right here in the Naperville Municipal Center. And um, again, that job fair, while not directly tied to uh, um, marketing for licensed teachers, we were able to uh, receive applicants who were interested not only in teaching but also as being in a part of our parapros and and some of our other uh, hourly positions so we're looking forward to really whatever we can do to uh, go after uh, people where there are and, and go towards them so with that being said um, I'm going to turn it back over to our director uh, Carrie Beff to talk a little bit more about our focus recruitment efforts So as I mentioned, uh, we attended our scheduled job fairs remotely this year uh, and connected with over 300 candidates at those events. We successfully ran two student teacher open houses, which we branded uh, Teaching 204 Open Houses, which had over 100 participants. Those we did uh, virtually, so we did those over Zoom. Um, but the open houses served as an exclusive networking opportunity for our current student teachers and anyone interested in working for 204 uh, to come meet with administrators and other student teachers. We shared with them our vision and current opportunities and they had their resumes reviewed, uh, asked candid questions of our staff and practiced interviewing. The feedback from this event was overwhelmingly positive and we were able to make some connections with these um, student teachers early and get them started in the, um, the hiring process. Uh, we will continue to work with the district equity leadership team, our newly formed affinity groups, and our university partners, uh, and we'll continue to recruit, recruit through local organizations. So we're very grateful uh, to all the leaders in all these different areas who help support us in our recruitment efforts. Lewis briefly introduced the Grow Your Own Teacher program to you that we rolled out this year. Uh, the work began with Deputy Superintendent Doug Icarius a few years ago and secured its foundations with the leadership team and subcommittees this summer. Um, our goal is to have our, student, our own students return as 204 teachers. And the I Became an Educator Because poster that we've displayed here on this slide 
um, is just one example of the way our teachers are sharing with our students how personal teaching is. Um, you can check out all the reasons in our classrooms, on social media, and in conversations throughout our schools. The picture that you can see here is from a recent event with high school students in which they had the opportunity to observe a teacher in another 204 high school. And so now I'd like to introduce Ann Clexton, a current 204 teacher and member of our Grow Your Own teacher leadership team, and Zoe Williams, a current Matias student uh, in the program. Hi, good evening. Um, secured a four-year grant through Illinois State Board of Education for CTE Career Pathways directed, directly supporting the education pipeline. And so beginning in May, the leadership team met for the first time The Grow Your Own Teacher program is a district tool for initiative and encourages all students to consider a career in education by offering a unique and distinctive opportunity for our students to learn and gain experience through classroom observations and hands-on teaching experiences during the school year. Our end goal was to help bring District 204 graduates back to our district after they had finished their college programs. The High School Programming and Oversight Committee began meeting multiple times this summer with three subcommittees. We have high school coordinators, we have a middle school after school club sponsor, and an exploration and alumni subcommittee. The high school coordinators and the oversight committee planned a fall recruiting kickoff on September 7th. This event was held here at the CEC. It was outside and all the high school coordinators, district personnel, as well as area state and college education programs were present to answer questions and to promote the field of education. Ultimately, over 60 students committed from Matia Valley, Niqua Valley, and Wabonzi Valley, and they will experience four classroom observations this year. The first one was held in October at the high school level. November 30th will be the middle school, and then we will have in third quarter an elementary school observation, and then fourth quarter they get to choose where they get to observe. We have monthly cohort debriefing with the students, whether it's via Zoom or in person. Um, we've had the opportunity to get all three high schools together. So all 60 students were able to debrief after that initial high school observation day here. Got to meet with Dr. Talley. It was a really, really incredible experience. And we hope that at the end of the year, there'll be some summer opportunities for these students as well to sign up to volunteer in classrooms, to intern in other volunteer observations. Good evening. Hello. I'm Zoe Williams, a junior at Mantilla Valley High School. I first heard of Grow Your Own Teachers through my English teacher. He is a Rubanzi graduate and was able to share the opportunities that this program has to offer and the benefits of her coming back to work in this district. Over the summer, I became interested in education. I want to have a job where I can serve my community and be able to work with kids. That is why I joined Grow Your Own Teachers which can provide me with the chance to see what my future could look like. For my observation, I went to Niqua and observed a world geography teacher. What was special about my observation is I also had the opportunity to observe her during her planning periods, meeting with teachers, and meeting one-on-one -on -one with students. I love that I had a chance to see the behind-the-scenes responsibilities of a teacher. One of the most inspiring parts of my observation was seeing the teacher have one-on-ones with students about their progress and goals so far. It showed me how maintaining a strong relationship between the student and teacher is crucial to a student's academic success and has further motivated me to pursue this career because I want to have the chance to build those relationships with students in my future. Thank you. So obviously, thank you, Zoe. Thank you, Ann. Um, hey, first, I'll, I'll just back up. So Ann was being a little modest. And, and what I mean by that is she has been amazing. Her and, and our other administrators and teachers, uh, they really worked and put in hours over the summer to really set the uh, 
uh, vision and goals and direction for this program. Uh, there were times, uh, if you can uh, imagine, that I would come in and say, hey, why don't we do this, 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 and Ann would say, slow down, this is year one. <laughs> and, and those things are important because while we're extremely excited and know about what we can start to throw at our students, we don't want our students like Zoe to be overwhelmed. Uh, we want them to get a good taste of what it's like uh, and just want them as they start to think about what this means for them to further solidify um, what they feel is really their calling because we know that education is a calling. And so Zoe's part of our 2021-2022 inaugur inaugural GYOT class. She's a junior, come back and a senior, and we <laughs> hope we'll see you in five short years from there, okay? <laughs> and so we're saying that now. Uh, because in five, five more years, we hope that uh, we can say that Zoe sitting up here is one of our first teachers that we're hiring back in our GYOT class. So we're really excited and proud of you, and we're, we're excited to see you do great things. Uh, at this, I'm going to turn it back over to our director, Carrie Beth. To follow up on that, I just wanted to say um, Welcome back to the 16 uh, 204 graduates that we hired back as teachers this school year. Um, we just talked about our goal as being, uh, as being one to recruit and retain 204 graduates. So again, a warm welcome back to our 204 grads. Um, for those that have, have left us, we understand that there are a number of reasons that staff decide to pursue employment elsewhere. But we also know that establishing a solid relationship at the time of hire improves retention and therefore re reduces the cost associated with recruitment and hiring. Our teacher retention rate is 95.7% compared to the state average of 85.9% and is a source of pride for us. We've retained 97.8% of our excellent rated teachers. District 204 continues to be a great place to work. As you can see here, our turnover was back to more typical, although expected based on the current situation that we're in. Of the 195.2 FTE who left the district, 89.7 uh, were licensed staff. This is 4.3% of our licensed staff. We also conducted, again this year, our exit survey. Um, we continue to build value in the exit survey and the response rate uh, reflects that. Responses were primarily teachers and at the elementary and early childhood level. Um, the, uh, all, all of our respondents who provided feedback provided um, valuable feedback to us. This slide represents the top three reasons that staff left the district. It's not surprising that personal reasons shows up and is so prominently represented here uh, in the survey. Um, I do want to remind you that um, these percentages are totals <coughs> of all respondents. Uh, finally, I just kind of want to send a shout out to all of our um, staff who were presented with service awards this year. I'm very proud to recognize 562 employees this year on their service awards uh, milestones. We formally recognize teaching service for 20, 25, 30, and 35 years of service uh, during our Institute Day program. Thank you, Carrie. So finally, we'd just like to again talk about what uh, our future focus remains and continues to be. Um, one of the first things that um, we recognize through um, this past and current situation is really um, we always know how wonderful and hardworking our staff is. I think we can always do um, an increased job of how we recognize them. So. What you're gonna to start to see is some more um, school-based recognition programs. Um, we've got some great district-wide programs right now, and I think we're gonna start doing some things. Uh, some of that's gonna include our parapros, where we'd like to potentially um, do some things with them once a month, 
where we recognize some of them. Uh, they are the glue within the classroom. Uh, as much as we talk about our, our great licensed educators, uh, they would not be there without our parapros, our teaching assistants. So we want to make sure we start to recognize them more, and we're going to be doing that. Um, some of the things I'm not going to speak about because we want to surprise. Uh, we want to just uh, be able to, to really uh, start to just take our time to, and, and really focus on that. We continue, and we will never, um, I think, shy away from this, just are committed to increasing our di diversity in our workforce. The data shows it. We have to reflect it uh, within our, our student body and teachers. Uh, so that will always be a bedrock commitment. And we'll continue to uh, work with community. We'll continu continue to work with staff on how we can continue to do that. We also want to look at how can we talk about what an Indian Prairie 204 teacher looks like. Uh, we had this, um, talked about a little bit about this last year. Um, I think our Grow Your Own Teacher program has taken us in that direction. And I think now we've got some tenants that will help us sort of profile what an IPSD 204 teacher looks like and start to advertise for that more. And then, um, as I'm excited about, and as Ann slowed me down on this, we're going to start programming for year two and three of our <laughs> Grow Your Own program. So Zoe will be a part of that, that uh, year two. We'll, we'll be doing some surveying of our current class, what went well, what didn't go well, um, what would you think should be better for year one, and what do you think we need to do for year two? Uh, maybe it's not just an observation, but how about maybe they're doing a small mini lesson for five minutes? I don't know. Um, one of the things I didn't talk about, we had an incredible response from our staff, uh, not just in terms of what Carrie Beth talked about, the I want to be an educator, uh, just um, prompt, but also just in terms of a survey that we sent out of who would like to have these students in their classrooms. And it was overwhelming uh, across the three levels. And so we'll be, we'll be using um, those staff in those efforts. And then finally, um, we have to maintain that high level of support for all of our staff. These are challenging times for not only our teachers, but our building administrators as well. Um, I would be remiss if I did not talk about our leaders. Uh, we know that research supports that the most powerful change that can happen besides the teacher in the classroom is the building leader and their vision. And the level of support that we have to provide them in these times is very important and um, also not missed by us. So. All those things are, are high lifts and heavy lifts, but um, we know that we're committed to doing that. Uh, at this time, uh, we'd like to take um, and answer questions that you may have. All right, how about Ms. Grover? Sure. Um, I want to say I appreciate all the hard work you've been putting in to recruit, to go out there, um, like some, you mentioned, there are about 860 school districts and 5,000 people going in. That's about six, uh, six um, teachers per school district, and we hired 52, and we have 50% diversity. You said we hired, I mean, it's just amazing. It goes kudos to the work you guys have been putting in. And I love the full circle, how we talk about we are introducing career readiness to preschoolers and getting it throughout, and now we have shadowing that we are doing in-house. So that's wonderful, and then these high schoolers will be shadowing and going to middle schoolers, and so those middle schoolers will see that. So I love that program, and um, I'm looking forward to see how we can also perhaps grow your own to TAs and so that they can become teachers and come back. So thank you. Mr. Kruba. Ms. Williams, I'm very impressed by your decision to make a presentation to the board tonight. Very impressed by your work as a student and very impressed by your initiative in advancing your education and career. And I look forward to hearing about your future success. Thank you. Ms. Dummy. 
Thank you, Mr. Karubas. I was going to say congratulations and thank you so much for being willing to come and share with us, Ms. Williams. So thank you so much. Um, really important to, to see this information from a, at a state level and to understand what the pool of teachers looks like. I cannot tell you how long that I've been in the district and especially since coming on the board, people will speak to me and say, you know, where, where, what are we doing to try and recruit diverse teachers and you know, diverse personnel into um, our district? And so uh, sharing with people how low the rates are, first of all, of numbers of population coming into education, but then to see that breakdown um, across what we look like from population percentages, that really helps. So, um, so kudos to being able to bring in the numbers that, that we're able to attract and that speaks so loudly to our district and, and the reputation that we have for being a strong district, which um, I just, I, I did wanna have um, make one comment and there was some, um, sometimes people will say and, and heard a little bit tonight, you know, well, as we're looking at making some shifts in the district, can't we look at possibly uh, lowering some, um, you know, making some changes in some particular areas and adjustment areas as far as our expenditures. And, you know, we've, one of the things that I just want to share and remind our community, we really do a lot uh, and we provide a great education. And if you, if we, I just encourage our community to really look at what we're doing, um, how much we spend per student, and then what our staff and our administrators receive compared to the state averages. And so we really, um, I, I really appreciate the community um, challenging us to find places to cut, but we really do do a really good job as far as uh, looking at our expenditures. And I just have to appreciate our staff um, and our administrators for all they do. And they're not at the highest level of the pay scale in our, uh, in our state, but um, they do a fantastic job and thank you so much for being here and sharing. Ms. Jane. Thank you everyone for presenting. <laughs> Just in case anybody was sleeping. <laughs> Wanted to wake up. Um, so one thing that we learned through COVID and I continue, especially remotely, and I can say this as a parent and as an educator, is how much we appreciate educators and how hard their work is. Um, I hope our society in general continues to appreciate this profession and encourage their, their children to look into this as a profession as you are trying to do with the Grow Your Own program. Um, so another thing that's been on my mind and has been on my mind lately as someone who's gone through the academic process here is how little and few educators I had in my life that were instructors of color. And the ones that were had a profound, profound impact on me. Um, and I didn't realize that until I reflected over my 22 years of education. I counted on my hand how many were actually instructors of color. And when I did that, I said, there was a game changer, there was a game changer for me, there was a game changer for me. Um, and so I can't help now being in the position that I am to continue to ask those questions that you are trying to answer with regard to diversity. But when we look at what slide was that uh, with the two bar charts um, comparing where we are, yes, that one, thank you, um, where we have a, a minority majority and then what the distribution is in our district, we know we have a long way to go. Um, and I hope also that to see a slide in the future about our administration back breakdown in terms of diversifying leadership in this, um, in this district because as you mentioned, uh, things will not change until we get diverse perspectives at all levels. Um, another thing that I know is that in the education system in general, pre-K through college, we have disproportionately minorities working in what we call um, 
the classified um, section. And so to board member Grover's point, I hope we have a concerted effort to take our diverse TAs and help them and motivate them and make it easier for them by through support so that they become licensed teachers. So I'd like to hear more about that, if you could share that. And the last thing I wanted to ask was um, just more clarification on this prep program. I can't seem to, I can't seem to get my head around it. Is, is the prep program, from my understanding, is geared towards college students who are trying to become teachers? So what is our role as a district with regard to that? I threw a lot of things at you. I no, apologize. No, don't it apologize. Was uh, it's important we get this information out here, and I, I, we do appreciate the question. So first of all, you know, Lewis University, Augustana, Illinois State, Aurora, all of the traditional and non-traditional colleges and universities throughout the state are now um, being, um, I don't want to say monitored, but they're being rated based on their teacher preparation program. So, um, and I can share the website with you, where now uh, actual students, before they decide where they want to go, they can type in their university and they will see based on the program uh, an area that they want to go to, so maybe early childhood, and the state has designated um, ex excellent, exemplary, uh, good, commendable, all of these ratings for each of these programs so that now students can select uh, which college or university based more on the area that they want to go into. What does that do for us and for the public as, and us as a district? It allows us to focus our recruitment efforts on some of these schools and maybe we can actually continue to build partnerships. So if we have a need for early childhood educators and one of our goals is to get the best and the brightest and we see that, uh, I'm not even gonna name a college uh, as an example, but if we see that college is exemplary in that area, then we can really target that school and say, look, we, we really wanna tr do what we can to get our foot in the door because we know that that can help us um, in our efforts when we start to interview them. We know that they're coming from these rated programs. The state has never done this before. So, and what, it, we, uh, what I think the state wants, obviously, is it will help um, some of the colleges and universities now that they're uh, being compared in one group uh, so that all can see, uh, very similar to public uh, school districts across the state. Uh, that that will encourage uh, growth in all of the areas so that all of their programs can continue to improve as well. And is the state asking for data from us in terms of post-hiring or? Yeah, right now they're not no. uh, okay. because the focus is really just on the preparation program. On the program, program itself, yeah. okay. And that's, and that's why. Now, who knows, they may start to um, one day down the line want to see how those individuals are doing in, in, in terms of retention data and other things, but currently they are only looking at the, these, those 52 uh, colleges and universities throughout the state with the teacher uh, preparation programs. Okay, thank you so much. That no problem, great that question, thank it. you. Um, and that's all I have, thank you. Ms. Fazdek. Um, I have one question first. Um, just for Grow Your Own. Uh, do you guys work at all with the FEA clubs at the schools? Because I know they do some, mm -hmm. you know, go in and work in the school once a week opportunities. I don't know if there's crossover there or if it's... There's a lot of crossover, extension actually. Extension of that? Okay. Yes. Um, we have three high school coordinators and two of the coordinators from Wabanzi and Nequa are the Educator Rising, which is okay. not what it's called, not FEA anymore. Okay. Um, Educator Rising... Um, coordinators and club advisors so there's definitely crossover okay. several of the students are in both um, I'm actually the ed rising <laughs> advisor at Matia and Zoe is in my club as well okay. and also as part of grow your own so yes there's crossover and they get multiple opportunities to be able to observe so Absolutely. they don't negate each other they actually enhance but yes there's a lot of similar children <laughs> That's great. I'm glad to hear that. Thank mm -hmm. you so much for being here tonight. So like, oh, it's cool <laughs> night to come and talk to us about your experience. I think it's incredible that you have it um, and that the district is doing what we can to support students 
learning what they can about what is that job actually like outside from what I do, right? So many little kids say, I want to be a teacher because that's all they see in action. But like you said, being able to see the planning period, the lesson creation, those other parts of the job that you don't often get to see, the fact that we're making that possible for students, I think is really important. Um, but then I just also wanted to say there are two data points that are just like huge kudos to our administration that I'm so impressed by. The teacher retention, but more than that, the fact that your teachers are saying, yes, we want to participate and grow your own. We want kids in our classroom. Because teachers who love kids are not bringing kids they care about into a work environment and saying, come do what I do, if they aren't happy. If they don't feel like their job is important and purposeful, and they don't feel like they're being supported. So I feel like that's the greatest evidence you could get of the, the type of work environment that we're fostering here. Um, and I, I just think that's wonderful for our community to hear and know about, but also kudos to you for that. Thank, thank you. you, and if I could just add to your comment, and thank you for that. Um, we enjoy a strong uh, partnership with the leadership of IPEA, and uh, I'm gonna put her on the spot. Katie Pop is here tonight, she's the president, and she had a huge part in helping us get this off the ground. Uh, and she's actually um, a Grow Your Own original uh, from the school district. So, uh, so I, 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 what your comment is right on, and, and it's really also just in collaboration uh, with our association and the leadership. Uh, they've been tremendous in the support of this. Mr. Rising. Thanks for naming educators rising after me. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, no, Zoe, Zoe, I wanted to say the same thing to you. Um, thanks for being here, taking time out of your night, although I know it's a long night. And, but most of all, thanks for being an educator and for being a teacher. It means a lot to all of us up here as well. Um, just a comment and a question. Well, no, actually, let's do the question. Slide five. Um, so this is a comment and a question, kind of. I would be in full support down the road or in the future to create some type of referral program for our district. Um, oftentimes, people aren't going to refer people to our district, whether it's a classified staff member or a certified staff member, that they think is going to be a bad hire. Um, same thing along with these positions that are very hard to fill. Oftentimes, those people know other people's nurses, know other nurses, OTs, PTs, STs, know other OTs, PTs, STs. So I would be in support of that if our budget, Matt's back there, if our budget can, can handle something like that. Um, and I think it would also help with the diversity as well. Um, so we could use it multiple different ways and factors. Um, so that was my kind of first comment question. Uh, slide 34. Yeah, there. Um, so Carrie, did you say this was last year's responses to the exit survey? No, this, this is the current. Oh, current, so okay. It, it's individuals who left at the end of the 2021 school year. Okay. Um, good to see that salary wasn't as bad as it was two years ago, because I know we made some improvements in the last teacher's contract to that. Um, the personal reasons, was that, I know you said that was extremely high, was that, I can't remember what it was last year, was it, uh, extreme, was it pretty equal to what we've seen in other years? No, it wasn't even, uh, 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 yeah, it wasn't. Uh, receiving the, the number of responses that we got this year. Like okay. I said, it's not that surprising considering the environment and circumstance we're in. Yeah. Um, but it is significant when you look at the, the feedback that we got from our, our staff. So it definitely played more of a part of role this year. Okay. Um, that's all the questions I had. Thanks for all you guys are doing. So thanks uh, for everything that you do. And thank you to my fellow board members for taking away many of my comments. <laughs> um, they're very eloquent and uh, thought, thoughtful people. 
So um, I do um, often mention the statistics that Ms. Grover and Ms. Deming brought up about the uh, difficulties and how few people are going into such an honored profession. And it's really something we all need to work hard to make turn around. Um, I can hardly think of too many other professions that you touch and change people every single day. And we need to put more importance and value into that um, across the, the country. Um, so I'm so happy, Zoe, that you um, have selected to pursue this program. I honestly was very surprised when I saw the charts because I did see the grow your own thing. And I think I wrote you a note at one point, Dr. Lee, about how um, uh, pervasive it was. Like I was seeing it everywhere and I was like, wow, this is so fantastic. I really didn't know the extent of it as far as recruiting students and you know, really giving them an opportunity to experience um, what it's like to um, be in a teaching role. So I'm uh, thrilled to death. I'm very happy our district was able to add 59 headcount this year to help start bringing down our class sizes because I also think that is a critical goal for the success of our teachers and our students and the continued success of our district. So. Um, so thank you for helping to educate our next generation of future leaders in the district. And uh, Zoe, we look forward to hearing from you again in the future. Thank you. So thank you. Okay, our next topic is legislative advocacy. Does anyone have any items to discuss? Yes, something. No, okay. And then Board of Education update, any information, general information on the, for the board? No. Allison and I have been working with uh, the teachers and the students on uh, potential student representation uh, on the board. And uh, the, pro the process is still um, progressing. We met last week. Um, and uh, I like the progress. We're gonna, we want to try to make sure we get it right. And uh, I think the ball's moving forward. So. Perfect. Yeah. There also is a LEN meeting on Friday that several of us will attend. Um, so we'll hear more about legislation that's moving forward. So our next item is IASB resolutions and position statements. And Ms. Grover is going to lead us through that topic. Sure. So um, we all got the paper copies of the IASB resolutions. So what I will do is I will just go through each one of them, kind of give a sentence, and if you guys want to discuss it, we can discuss it um, at the end. So the first one um, has been there prior also. It's pre-service teacher education and license. So basically what they are saying is teachers should complete at least one undergraduate level course solely dedicated to scientifically proven methods of reading instruction. So this was there before as well. Um, the only difference was from last year in this year's, they put um, language that says um, cut scores. If you look, look down, it says, you know, somewhere there, scientifically proven methods of reading dedicated. And then, so I asked them, what does that mean? And <laughs> IESB said, to my knowledge, nothing changed except for the views of the resolution committee. And the resolution committee said to adopt this. The second one is student safety and protection plan. And this has been there previously as well. And um, this one is they want the school district is asking to arm voluntary district employees in any capacity to carry concealed um, weapons after undergoing training. And like I said, this has been there before. And ISB said to adopt this resolution. The third one has been presented before as well, and that is school board member compensation. It's pretty self-explanatory where they say school board members should be paid for what they do. And IASB says to not adopt this. Fourth is a little different in the sense that instead of the getting paid, it's more for child reimbursement. 
And for this one, IESB says to adopt. Five is we have been doing, um, you know, because of COVID, we had Zoom meetings. And so basically this puts it into a statement saying that, you know, if we abide by all the other things with the Open Meetings Act, as in we have a quorum, we put notice, um, let's go forward and have virtual meetings approved. And for this one, IASB said adopt. Number six is to reorganize the board structure because what happens is after an election, you have to reorganize the board, vote for the president um, and all those, um, all those leadership positions within 28 days. And so they're saying to change it to 40 days because sometimes what happens is you have, so say you have your election, but your next session is going to be 30 days from the election. So it's not within the 28 days. So that's why they're asking to change it to 40 days. And here they say to go ahead and adopt. Number seven is um, pretty self-explanatory in the sense that it is to put um, in a curriculum regarding indigenous people because it is not part currently um, of the social studies curriculum, um, whereas other entities are. And for this, IESB says to go ahead and adopt. Number eight is it deals with reading. And what they are saying is to use a curriculum called Science of Reading in their K-5 to level curriculum. And what the Science of Reading curriculum is, it's a phonetic education curriculum, but this is Science, I looked it up, science of reading is actually a curriculum. So it's not saying a reading curriculum, but it's an actual specific curriculum. And for this one, um, the resolution committee said do not adopt. Number nine is um, regarding the health and sex education curriculum. So SBO 818 was passed providing guidelines and standards for age appropriate personal health and safety education as well as uh, sexual health education. And here the district is saying that they want local control of content and curriculum. And here IASB says to adopt. Number 10 is regarding cannabis sales. And here the district is asking for 20% um, of state tax revenue that results from cannabis sales to be used for public education programs within the district, but it's only for those districts that fall under a um, disproportionately impacted area. And here, um, IASB says do adopt, and just for our purposes, um, IPSD does not fall under that. Number 11 is regarding clean energy. And here it is, um, they're saying it is for using solar panels for geothermal heating and cooling in wind turbines. And here IASB says do not adopt. And um, 11 and 13 are kind of similar, and I'll go um, into that. Number 12 is about electric school buses, where the district is saying that um, the federal government should provide federal funding to school districts for clean electric school buses. And um, IESB says do not adopt. And their re rationale was, well, you can look for other cleaner burning fuels instead of just electric. So number 13 is interesting because in number 11, which they said do not adopt, which was for solar panels, Number 13 is about using um, federal funding for landscaping and infra infrastructure improvements to mitigate the effects of environmental problems. And here, IESB said, do adopt. So um, one of the questions I had posed to IESB was like, well, um, and there's a belief statement at the end. It talks about energy. And so the question was, um, you know, at number 13, you said do adopt. Number 11, you said don't adopt. It's kind of inconsistent if we're talking about environmental and kind of agreed with that. 
They said, well, that's the ISB rationale. Um, number 14, expanding broadband. So here, um, they were, wanted to expand broadband internet access for families across the state of Illinois. Pretty self-explanatory, um, do adopt. Number 15 is something we have seen before also, and this is to for the, the child safe gun storage. And what it would do um, currently, it would reduce the, my, reduce the age um, to 14 years, because currently what happens is a person has to put away their gun in a storage, uh, in a store their firearm safely. Um, if a person is under the age of 18, is likely to gain access. So this would change it to under the age of 14. What IESB said that um, it would be overreaching, and that's why they said do not adopt. They said, you know, although it, it's a it's a good um, resolution, but the problem is it would reach into the person's private home, and that's why they said do not adopt. Um, 16 is with the school code. Basically here, the district, what it wanted to do is um, do an in-depth review of the school code and make re recommendations for systematic education change. And um, the ISB said do not adopt. And the amending, the, uh, we have amended existing positions and um, they just, if you notice number 17, what they did is they just changed the language they added equitable services and they gave specifics of um, who it would relate to. And um, it, I think part of it is because of, you know, the equity um, belief statement that came out. And so they were just, it's the same statement, but they were just giving specific, uh, specifying the different um, subcategories of the people, the students, number 17. Number 18 is reaffirmation. Um, what they said is the reason these are always reaffirmed is because a school district who posed these reaffirmations has a charter school in their district. And so basically all these three things are saying that before the charter school renews, they need to let us know when we need to be involved. And so basically these three things are kind of saying the same things but in different variations, I would say. Um, the first one is the renewal of charter school, let us know. The second one, which is position 19, is saying um, urge adoption of legislation that defines uh, special expectations. Charter schools, what are they gonna do to educate at-risk students? So they just want the charter schools to be responsible. And the third one, the position 20, is that they don't want the charter schools, um, they don't, the school district does not want to lose public education school funding because of charter schools because as you know if there's a charter school opened so the public school system loses the money it goes to the charter school instead and they are reaffirming isp reaffirms all those statements um, the last position statement number 21 is um, it regards the illinois disability act and it defines um, specific, specific, it defines um, things that we should do, or that the district should do. For instance, um, educate children with special needs, including transportation, um, fund local districts for special education professional personnel at 50% of the prior uh, year's average salary. So it has all these different um, categories for special needs um, students. And here, the resolution committee says do adopt. And then we have the new belief statement, which was our belief statement on, which is number 22, which is prepare all students to succeed. And here, we said that, I'll just read it. <laughs> The Illinois Association of School Board believes that school districts should prepare all students to succeed and cultivate learning. To that end, IASB urges school districts to consider adopting a policy encouraging students to complete assignments within a reasonable time frame, even after the due date. 
by developing guidelines on how to grade a student's late assignments. And just for a background, what happened was at the IASB meeting, if you look at their rationale, they said that they proposed a um, language amendment to which we did not agree. Their language amendment would have stopped um, the language even after the due date. But the essence of the belief statement was to prepare guidelines for students' late assignments. So the essence was after that part. So we disagreed, and so then they said, okay, we'll keep that part. Um, there's no discussion here. If you see in the rationale, they talk about a no zero policy, but there's nowhere, nowhere in the belief statement does it talk about a zero policy or anything because it was more like it's up to the teacher, um, the school district to prepare guidelines and the teacher would then follow those guidelines. So let's see, we are at number 23, which was the physical and mental health of students. And here it's just a slight change. They just amended the belief statement to add physical and mental, whereas before it said physical, and they added the dental and, men and physical, whereas before um, you had to submit vision and physical examinations, and they added dental to that. And that's basically it. All right, so we're gonna go through and um, ask the board if they wanna talk about each one of those, right? Today we're having discussion, we're not voting on anything. Okay. I just said, and I, I just said one. And I don't know, and I'm just bringing this up just because I know um, board member Jean went with um, board member Grover, so she may understand a little bit of the process. But for um, board member Fosdick's um, edification, I just wanted to find out, because I remember when I was a first time board member, I was a little confused. Were, were you clear on why we're having the discussion and what this, what, what this means and, and it's why we're having the discussion? I just wanted to ask that. That's if I'm clear on why we're having a discussion about all of these. Why we're having a discussion these? and what will, what, what will happen when we actually vote and why we're having to vote. With I think this. so. It's so, okay. so we can have cool. board member Grover go and present. This, this is our district's position on Perfect. these resolutions, correct? Perfect. Is right. that? Okay. And, and to be Thank clear. Thank you for checking, though. I appreciate it. Yeah. To be clear, um, if we accept, um, if we recommend to adopt these, that means IASB will um, lobby for it or, or say positive things about that topic. It doesn't mean it's a state law that's getting passed or whatever, but if there is legislation that's going on, they will pursue it as the resolutions tell them to, and they also will uh, lobby for things that we pass as recommended. Thank you. So do you want to go down the list and just sure. ask who wants to talk? So to talk about it, that means you either want to make a statement, you might agree with it, but you just want a public statement about that item, or you disagree with the position that IASB took, the resolution committee that took. So. Okay, sounds good. Um, the, the first one is the teacher education and license in literacy. Um, they wanted to adopt. Um, who agrees with adopting? I guess well, we should have a discussion. Well, we're not, not going to vote. Oh, that's right. Say, I'm sorry. Does anybody sorry. want have a discussion. to discuss that's right. this one? Yes. Ms. Jane? Do you want to have a discussion when we vote? Or? No, no okay. just a discussion. I'm going to disagree with the recommendation. Yeah. So, so you say, I want, to, I want to raise that one as one I want to discuss. I, what she said. <laughs> <laughs> so do you want to go down the list right now and look at each one of them? Or discuss we can discuss it as we go along yeah. okay so all right so what are your comments mr Carubis? well i think we just heard about a teacher shortage and we've got a lot of state mandates i think i don't think we should be putting more um restrictions um, and focus on a, solely a one issue requirement and not look at the whole of what is necessary to become a teacher um, and I'm not sure that it should be the school board a group of elected volunteer individuals that may not necessarily have pr proficiency in teacher training making a decision on this 
So it also means that if we flag one that we disagree with the position, then we will vote on that one next time. If we agree with whatever they put, then we're not voting on it at the next meeting. So does anybody else have any comments on number one? President uh, Donahue, I also disagreed with this. I felt that this particular, as they indicated um, in the third paragraph, that the um, uh, 43 percent of university teacher education programs in, in Illinois earned a D or an F for how they prepared students to teach scientifically proven methods for reading. So I do not think that we should, as a uh, district or that this uh, board district should be penalizing teachers when it's the program that's been identified as having the problem. So I, I did not agree with uh, adopting this. Well, but let's be clear about this. This is not This is something that this is something that colleges would take on to prepare teachers. This is not something that we are making a decision. It's just better preparing our teachers before they come out of college to be able to more effectively teach those courses based on a class that they may have to take when they are in college. I, I, I see what you're saying. I just feel like they need it. Obviously, if you have a standard, a national standard saying that the programs that we have to teach them aren't up to par, then you can't penalize the teacher. They need to be looking at the programs. They're saying 43% of our university programs have a D or an F as far as trying to teach our, uh, you know. But I think that's the problem read. with Illinois is they, if I remember correctly, from last year when we talked about this with Dr. Talley, we are one of the we are one of the few states that do not have some type of program in place to better train our teachers in this literacy area. Can you turn down my mic? It's like <laughs> blasting. <laughs> and I can't get farther away. <laughs> Does anyone have any other comments on this? Yes. I feel That's somewhat right. encouraged that it might be taken out of our hands in a positive way by the presentation we just had from Dr. Lee about the state ranking teacher education programs. Perhaps that will be perhaps this is something that will be addressed by that ranking itself and universities and um, higher education institutions can then take a look at their own rankings and decide collectively whether or not this is something that needs to be added if they're if we see that they're being compared to others so perhaps this is not something we need to address it could be addressed by this program that is fully getting rolled out now and in that regards I agree with mr. Karubas because is this really something we should be discussing as this is something the college educators should be discussing with legislators not <laughs> At the same time, though, I'm not I'm not really clear how cumbersome this requirement would be. Like, right. you know, is this something that can be fulfilled pretty easily? And would that be result in our teachers being more mindful about, you know, I, I'm not going to pretend to be an expert in that area by any means. And I feel like there's a lot there's a lot missing here for us to make that decision. And can Dr. Talley speak to, to this? Yes. She also has. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I, I, <laughs> <laughs> Jeff is looking. So here's what I will say about um, the a program. Um, what we want for elementary ch uh, ch children would be to have teachers who have that background in literacy, plain and simple. Mm -hmm. um, we'd have to look very specifically at the program that teachers are coming out from. I would be hard pressed to believe that they are leaving a program without some type of scientifically based program um, for uh, teachers. And so I would just look at that a little bit more and we can look into that and come back with you for an answer. Okay. Well, the other thing I wanted to point out, it says passing score. So. Um, you can pass with one point. I mean, it doesn't mean you learned anything or you're not. Um, so, okay, so I flagged that one. Okay, the second one, can we move on? Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. great. Um, the second one is a student safety and protection plan. Um, I disagree with the do adopt, so it's, I mean, if anybody wants to discuss it or we can just vote on it next time or. 
you know, I made a very strong statement on now behalf. Now you can't hear you. Yeah, now you can't hear me. Great. Okay. I made a very strong statement two years ago on behalf of our board to not support this. Um, on one hand, I, I think they watered down their resolution even more because it said that they would not only get training um, for the concealed carry uh, and certified active shooter, they also had that they would get the same training as a SRO, which they took out of that, I noticed. Um, but I gotta tell you, because it's not required of all districts to do this, it allows the individual local districts to make the decision if they want to do that. And given this district, you know, if you read that, they they're, could take police an hour to get to one of their schools. You know, I, I mean, I, I kind of feel for their school board a little because they they can't get they can't hire SROs they can't find them um, they have the money but they still can't even hire them and find them so uh, on the other hand I, I I feel for them and their situation because they're just trying to protect their students as well um, it doesn't mean that every board has to do this though it's up to the individual board so yeah I, I kind of go back and forth on this one a little bit. I, I think one of the um, things, though, we have to keep in mind is, say we send our kids to play a sport in another school district that has adopted this. Um, you know, keep in mind that it's our students going to a school district who perhaps adopts this policy, then our students would be affected. Maybe they wouldn't be affected when they're in our school district, but they travel. I still... I still support the do not adopt. I haven't wavered on this one from Maybe. the last two times that we this has come up. Yeah, I guess I, and I'm a little frustrated being the um, president here because I like want to jump in because this is one that I do feel <laughs> passionately. <laughs> Go ahead. That we should. I, I don't support it. I I think I read this being submitted four different times. I I don't understand why we would soften our position. I actually agree with Mr. Rising that they softened the words and previously it was presented because they said they didn't have money to hire somebody and now it's now they can't find someone to hire um, and I just think it's just really wrong that we ask our professional licensed staff to perform critical roles in our schools such as a nurse or a social worker teacher yet we are ironically debating allowing a person who lacks extensive professional certification to carry a weapon capable of killing our students. Mm -hmm. So I'm very much opposed to this. I agree with uh, President Donahue, and I also just um, am quite shocked that the same district is bringing up the, this resolution and in an attempt to just resolve their issue. I don't think any resolution should be passed for to resolve one district's issues I, I don't think that's good practice it's it's too broad be, uh, any other comments on that it was brought up in 2017 2018 2019 yep. so, okay um, number three school board member compensation next I agree with that I, I just, just have I'll oh, go ahead I don't know you disagree with you that? Wanna, I'm gonna disagree with this okay <laughs> Um, found out that board members in Florida make forty thousand dollars a year. <laughs> in Maryland, yeah. what, what do they make in Maryland? Maryland board members make um, about fifteen to twenty thousand a year. I, I think we're missing a um, a demographic. I ask school board members that don't get compensated for their time. Um, I don't think it has to be in anywhere near the $40,000 figure for that to happen. We have plenty of local elected officials that make $10,000, $5,000. Um, so I think some mode of compensation um, would make sense. Um, being a volunteer, you have to have um, the capacity to volunteer um, and you have to uh, have the support. So I think that narrows down 
who can be a school board member. And it's missing a voice here. I think this is more advantageous than the reimbursement. Um, that is, I think, way too narrow than um, I believe people might have different reasons where they can't volunteer and serve and limiting it to child care um, is an unnecessary limitation. Other comments? Um, I also uh, agree with board member Karubis on this. I, I don't think the compensation has to be um, such a high amount, but I do think there's, there is an equity issue here that uh, the volunteer nature is um, filtering out individuals who could make this happen with a little bit of compensation. For example, today, I've been, we're, we've been here for a long time, dinner had to get resolved at home. Although I was fed here, my family wasn't. And I am the one who generally makes dinner. It's, it's small things like that, and I, and I realize that you know everybody makes their sacrifices, but I do think it's taken for granted. Um, and I'm not thinking that it's a large compensation, but I don't think it should be um, uh, not a choice for, for example, a single parent who does want to spend their extra time volunteering for the board. Finances should not be the reason why they don't run for a school board. I disagree um, with the. I, I disagree with the board member Karubas. I I don't think that uh, this is a direction that that we need to move in because I think it can be unrealistic for people to one expect that the compensation is going to um, make a difference for the, for what you the time and energy that you need to put into uh, this you know, this volunteer opportunity. And I also think that it could maybe encourage people to potentially run for not the um, reasons of true volunteerism. I think if, if, I personally think that if you want to, if this is something that is, uh, that you're called to do or really want to do, then, um, you're gonna make that decision to be able to do it. I don't think that ten or $12,000 type of stipend is going to allow and make a difference for someone um, to be able to volunteer in this opportunity. And I agree with Ms. Dumming for the same reasons. I don't think we would uh, pay a lot, or if we did, I would hate to see it grow because, okay, we didn't give them enough to make a difference all this year. Maybe it's 10,000 next year, it's more. Um, we need every penny for our students, and I think that um, if you pay somebody throughout 10,000 times seven of us, that's a teacher right there. Um, I don't think it would compensate someone enough to make this attract more attractive for the time that's spent on it. So. As a point of procedure, are we, are we debating these bills? Are we giving oh, our- Oh, you're giving your perspective. So we're so that when we, we vote next week, you've heard yeah, what so everybody so has. So now to you say. make up your mind on next week when next time when we do, we just vote. Like, so even if I'm if I'm supportive of the recommendation, I make a statement if I want to. Yeah, you can. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, number four, um, child care reimbursement. Your comments? On I, this? Yes, um, I actually agree with what Mr. Krupas has to say. I would support this if it were broadened to include uh, like a hardship reimbursement that could include elder care, let's say, mm -hmm. instead of child care, right? A lot of us are in a position where we have not only children to care for, but other family members um, or other accommodation reimbursement instead. I, I can't support this committee recommendation of do adopt. Um, first of all, who's paying it? The district? and and. And, you know, it, it just, again, uh, you're doing, you're serving on a school board because you're passionate about kids, your community, your district. Um, I understand that that may prevent somebody from running, but they have to make accommodations. Um, 
you know, I, I, I don't even understand the committee's rationale on this. It, it absolutely makes no sense to me. And they didn't identify where that money's coming from. I'm assuming it's coming from the district. But, I mean, but they, never, they didn't mention that anywhere where the money's coming from to pay for this. It's coming from the state? Is it coming from, you know, what fund is it coming out of? I, I mean, you know, so I, I just, I, I can't support this. And I know we're not making our decisions now, but I just, I, this one is just confusing to me. I don't well, support the. I don't support this one either for many of the reasons that uh, Board Member Rising mentioned, and for me it follows along with uh, a lot of along the lines of number three. So I would not vote to um, adopt this. <coughs> yeah, I thought it was worded very strangely. Like I had a lot of trouble understanding um, because it broadens the what should be covered like child care for time off of work and it's like if you're working usually you have child care so why would you get time what would you be paying for I, I don't know it just brought up lots of issues for me that I I thought were it was worded just very strangely for me so I'm not supportive okay number five um, the virtual school board meetings I mean if we all agreed for it then we could probably move on Right, unless you want to make a statement about it. I think it's a good idea. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Number six, um, board from 28 days to 40 days. Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. Good. Okay, great. Number seven, indigenous people's curriculum inclusion. Yes, yes. for me. Yes. 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 Okay, number eight. Um, science of reading curriculum this one oh okay it says do not adopt so I agree with that I agree with their recommendation too yep. I mean just say if somebody disagrees or they want to make a statement yeah. they speak up does anybody want to make a statement on number eight or disagrees with it no okay number nine um, health and sex education curriculum anybody disagree or want to make a statement I just wanted to I I just am so unclear with this because if if SB 0818 is already giving the board the discretion to um, to to uh, choose the curriculum, why do we need this res resolution? It's it's not um, Senate Bill 818 is aligning with the national sex ed curriculum and what this does and this passed and the governor signed it is that what they did was that any district that has a um, comprehensive sex ed curriculum in place what this basically says is that you cannot have your own curriculum as a district, you can't make your choice of your curriculum. You have to align to the national sex ed curriculum um, if you're going to have a program. So it's not a it's not a choice. It's not a decision. The, the the state is making a decision for us on what the curriculum is. But the language says may. Right? They highlighted highlighted that in the in the paragraph that although SB zero eight one eight currently states a school district may use the new curriculum, they fear that it could change into shall. So instead of having discretion that, that it would be mandated, but it hasn't well, been done yet. Well, no, because it was passed on the premise that it would align to I mean I can show you the article from the from the state in in the summer. Um, that and was essentially we would be the first state in the United States that aligns to the national sex education standards. No other state has adopted that yet. Mm -hmm. And if you've read it's that, battery. it's pretty concerning. Um, some of the stuff in there. So, you know, if, if we're going to support number eight, which allows us to make a decision on science and reading curriculum, to me. We should be supportive of a district making a decision on, um, you know, what curriculum that we have for sex ed. But I, I don't think there. So to me, 
my confusion was here is um, the state has mandated something like a curriculum and the, the local school district is saying we don't want to abide by the mandate. That's how I took it. Even though the mandate says you may. Here, I'll read it to you. The new law, which takes effect immediately, requires public schools in the state of Illinois that offer sex education to align their curriculum with the national sex education standards, the creation of organizations um, that advocate for sex, sex, sex ed content, um, um, Pritzker, uh, no, 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 sorry, I didn't have this prepared. Well, let me ask you something, um, Mr. Rising. Don't we align by the curriculum when it comes to, for example, a social studies state curriculum or other curriculums? Don't we align like the core we, curriculum, core? Um, in the we align to the, the state science standards, but we can pick whichever curriculum we want that as long as it aligns to that standard. Okay, I, I, when I looked at this, the SB, I thought it was having guidelines. I didn't say I didn't see it saying that you have to choose this particular. I can I can okay. send it to the board. Maybe as I'm reading from the bill uh, from the General Assembly, it reads as follows: <clears throat> Beginning no later than July 1st, 2023, requires a school district, including a charter school, to provide comprehensive personal health and safety education in kindergarten through the fifth grade and comprehensive sexual health education in sixth grade through twelfth grade in all public schools sets forth the criteria that all, cra all classes that teach comprehensive personal health and safety and comprehensive sexual education must satisfy contains among other provisions provisions concerning guest lecturers or resources persons participation, the review of instructional materials, learning standards, resource materials, and reporting. Requires a school district, including a charter school, to provide age and developmentally appropriate consent education in the third through twelfth grade. Sets forth what the instruction and materials must include. Right. It doesn't tell you to use this particular material. It just sets forth the guidelines. Well, then if you're in support of that, you'll support this resolution well, that allows the district to choose what they want to choose well then it's a moot resolution mm. right. that that's why I'm saying Senate bill 818 aligns to the curriculum with the national sex education standards I think the once you read through the bill and I we all should do that before we vote on this of uh, the law is it's a very in, there's an interplay between the use of the word may and shall. There's sections in there that say um, you may adopt this, and if you do, th it may not conflict with these sections. So if you teach health and sex education, this is what it's going to look like. It may not conflict with this. So there's some provisions in there that are discretionary by the use of may. So I, I think we should inform ourselves on exactly what the public act reads before we vote on this. And I also think that one of the things here in the first paragraph, it says, you know, that they basically are advocating for the local school district to control the curriculum. So they're basically, the, the, their resolution is for the local district to make a determination on what they, feel is appropriate in the health and sex education curriculum, whether or not it falls falls in line with, you know, state mandates. Okay. Okay, number 10, um, cannabis sales. Do we want to discuss? You know, I wish it just didn't align with um, what is it? What did you say? The, the wording that the you used? The dis, disproportionately impacted areas. I wish it was mandated to give that all that 20% right. to I all education. It, it, does, it does say that. No, I know. I wish it wasn't. I wish it was all education, not just a disproportionately. Those are already the, those are already the tier one districts anyway. They're getting a bulk of the state education funding money. 
<laughs> I wish it was going to all school districts. So and this not is what, just... but it says that it would allocate no less than 20% of cannabis sales tax revenue be distributed equitably to school districts, especially those situated in communities heavily impacted by drugs use and addiction. But it says be distributed equitably to school districts. No, but, but Susan, if the second line, these funds shall be divided yeah, across the state rate right, on the dis DIA maps. Like we're not even on the DIA maps. Okay. So it, the sales would only go to certain school districts who are under those. So do we want to vote on this one? To yeah, me, it's unequitable vote. funding. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, that's it, it. Screams unequitable funding. Okay. To me. He's got zero chance of passing. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I marked it as um, we'll vote on it. Um, number 11, the clean energy infrastructure. This was a solar panel one where the, the rationale was um, one of the committee members said, well, we just got solar panels and, you know, d diversion of federal funding might happen. So, so I'm just going to make a blanket statement here. On 11, 12, and 13. Yeah. These are not our issues. They're, it's federal money. Uh, now we're gonna uh, we're gonna ask IASB to lobby for us at the federal level. I mean, it's just dumb. I, I mean, I don't know what I, I don't know what Champagne is thinking. I'm sorry, but the, the proposed the district that made these proposals. I mean, do they not understand what the rationale of these resolutions are? Because th this is federal money. Now we're 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 asking IASB to lobby for us for federal money that we get on environmental things. I, I mean, w th this is ridiculous to me. It, it, it's throwing everything against a tree and seeing if it sticks, in my opinion. Agree with you. For more and money for public education, I support it. I mean, it, yeah, it's silly, but they can write a letter to a local congresswoman that might have graduated from NEQA and say, <laughs> give me more money, and they don't have to go to Washington to do it. It's, you know, it, it's additional money to the, to the district. I think if we go um, 11 and 13 or so, like, for them to say yes to one and no to the other, it makes no sense. So 11, are we just, we can continue to discuss or are we? Just vote. We ready to we vote? vote. We'll, no. just vote. Okay. we'll have to just vote how we Ms. feel. Ms. Fostick? I was just gonna say, I, in addition to being good for the environment, I think they have great learning opportunities for our students. So to say it's not education related, I don't wholly agree with that. Especially with number 13. If we have rain gardens, pollinator gardens, stormwater detention. Those are those are learning opportunities for students as well, or at least potential. So, Mr. Karubis, when you commented, so 11 and 12 have a do not adopt, and the 13 has a do adopt. Are you? I support advocating for more money from the federal government to support uh, local education. Okay. These little buckets, I, I don't have much concern about we could debate what is clean energy you know you know include nuclear in there we can get into all these things but uh you know additional money for the federal government sure. so number 12 is for electric buses um which is going to be really expensive i don't know where you're going to get all that federal money for the electric buses especially the number of buses we have but um do we want to discuss this or are we are we going to vote on it and discuss them all Okay. Yeah. Okay. Then we can vote on it. Then. Okay. Number fourteen, um, broadband internet. Support. Support. Yeah, support. Okay. So then I think number fifteen. Um, probably need to discuss this one. This law is not going to be really enforceable. Um, there might be situations where a gun is found that isn't properly stored. I bet it is not a charge that a state's attorney is going to bring, um, but it does inform a standard of care on how you should keep guns safe. I think the people that are going to keep guns safe do so um, more than the state minimum, um, and the people that don't are not going to, but police aren't going to check. And if it, they hit a situation where it comes up, they're not going to charge it. So I support it. 
do support the do not adopt? No. So they recommend the do not adopt. I'm, I disagree with the recommendation. Yeah, I, okay. I'm on the same. I would like to vote on this one. Okay, we'll I, vote on it. Uh, yeah, okay. I'm, I will be not be. I will be supporting what they recommend of do not adopt. I think it oversteps the bounds of school districts to mandate what goes on in people's homes. I mean, trust me, I don't want guns to get oh, in, the, in the hands of ch ch children either. But who's going to police that? I, I mean, really? Now we're telling people how to what school districts are now telling people what to do in their own homes. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's Dirty. a little overstepping of our bounds as a school board member. I think we do that in parenting workshops that we offer at the district. So in my mind, this isn't anything other than a suggestion of responsible stewardship of your child and your home. Any more discussion on 15? Oh, okay. Um, 16, school code review. To support the do not adopt. I do as well. Yep. Yeah. It's too broad. <laughs> okay. Um, so, okay, so that one we don't need to vote for. Um, 17. No. I support the recommendation. Of, okay. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, yes, I supported the recommendation. Yeah. Okay. Um, 18, 19, 20 are like the same thing with, regarding the charter school. Discussion? Good to go? Okay. Um, 21, the special education program. I supported that recommendation. Mm -hmm. I don't know about that 22. <laughs> <laughs> Well, How are you going to buy it? We have to consider who wrote 22. <laughs> we good? 23. 22 and 23. 23. Good. 23 is, I think, good to go. And I think we're good. good. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All right. We need a motion to adjourn, right? Motion to adjourn. There's a second. 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 All in favor. Aye. 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 10, 20. Holy Thank you. Cow. I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, I warned you ahead.